Okay, good evening, everyone. We will now continue part number three in this incredible discourse, Purim discourse that we're learning. We're holding in Perek Tess. This is in the Sefer, Yavu, um, Sefer Shari Oira, which is a book written by the Mittel Rebbe, Second Chabad Rebbe. He's exploring Purim. And in the last two classes, which we spent already six hours already, we learned about the... We learned how... Um, Purim was a conclusion of the giving of the Torah. And for that reason, all the divine levels that were revealed by the giving of the Torah were also revealed on Purim. And one of the places you can see how those, th that godliness was revealed on Purim was when Haman says, let them bring the garment that the king wore when he, when he, when he was coronated, when they put the crown on his head, and they should bring also the horse that the king rode on on the time of his coronation. And they should dress up the person that the king is interested in honoring. And they should parade him in the city and they should say, so is done to the person who the king desires to honor him. And as we're learning, the Torah and, the, and the, these verses have very deep godly meaning besides the simple meaning. So we were learning that, the, 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 that all these items, which are three items, the garment, the crown, and the horse are all three entities. Which garment is it? They're referring to God. The king is referring to God, referring to Hashem. And the garment of the king is referring to that it says God garbs himself in pride. God became king and he garbs himself. Hashem, 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 Molach, God became king. Geus Lavesh, he garbs himself in pride. That pride garment, that's the garment that God. The Ein Sof, Hashem Himself, garbs Himself in, the, in, 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 a, in a garment of pride, which is, the, which is the royal garment. And also the crown is referring to, uh, by the giving of the Torah, it says that, the, that we crowned God with crowns. And then God took of His crowns and gave those crowns back to the Jewish people. And we said every Jew got two crowns. And the horses are, by the, it says in, in Yeshaya Hanavi, when you came riding down on your on your on your um, on your horses, your chariots of salvation. So that's referring to Hashem coming to town, Hashem coming down to this world during the giving of the Torah. God came riding on chariots, driven by the horses. So in the uh, last two classes, we were learning what these levels are. Since Purim was the conclusion of the giving of the Torah, so whatever was revealed by the giving of the Torah was also revealed on Purim, and in a sense even much deeper. So the horses we didn't get to yet. He explained, so far he explained the garment and the crown. So he, the, the, I just want to follow along the mimer. The mimer went and discussed the first idea that was explained in the discourse is that why, which one is greater? Is Torah greater or mitzvahs are greater? He brought all kinds of proofs that Torah is greater and mitzvahs are greater. And he explained, and this discourse primarily is explaining how the mitzvahs are infinitely greater than the Torah. Because Torah is Chachma, and Chachma is already the beginning of Ishtal Shalut. It's the beginning of the chain-like progression of worlds. From Chachma, you can say that, you know, Chachma is the, is the kernel, it's the seed of all of existence. So from the seed, the seed only has to, like, um, you have to germinate the seed, but it's that seed that contains everything already. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but then beyond Chachma is the Orin Sof. The Orin Sof is not is not a seed for creation. The Orin Sof is outside of the entire Orin Sof, meaning the infinite light, is undefined, and therefore it's not in any way, shape, or form any type of any kind of relationship with creation. From that level, all of existence is absolutely not, and also all of create all of existence is created something from nothing which means there's nothing of the essential quality of the Ein Sof that is translated into the creation. Because if there would be something, even just one cell of the Ein Sof, if you might say, translated into creation, then the creations would be Ein Sof. The creation would be infinite. From Chachma we can say it's already racious. Because Chachma is embedded in the creation. Because Chachma is already emerges after God takes a quantum leap to create. But Kesser is the Ein Sof itself. And it's therefore it's utterly unknowable and inconceivable and unconnected. 
Now we did speak, and we did explain that there is one aspect in creation where the where, that connects particularly to the transcendental infinite energy of the Ein Sof. In other words, the, the koach of the Ein Sof, the power of the Ein Sof, its effect on creation is is in a way of 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 distance, very distant. In other words, we say it. Now, based on what we said before, it would almost seem like creation is a total is only a product of God first. God first, um, 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 translating Himself to be a source for creation. It would be something like this: God metamorphosized some of His energy. Metamorphosize, you know what that means? Yeah. Good. God metamorphoses changes something radically. Hashem, me, we're, we're, what, what, what is, 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 is co- totally different than what was. It's a complete new, pan, like you say in Hebrew, panem chadashas. A whole new face comes over here. So um, the, the, this leap, so we would say that all of creation is God first metamorphosizing himself into a stage of chachma, into a seed that can be a seed of, of, of existence, of somewhat definable existence. And then from chachma, from Chachma, he develops the world. And that would mean anything beyond Chachma. The Orin Sof that's beyond Chachma, which is infinitely higher than this metamorphosis of the divine, is, 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 is not related to creation at all. It doesn't even take part in creation. It remains private. It remains withdrawn. It's, it's, it's uninvolved, if you might say. It's not even active in the act of creation. It's, it's, it's no, beyond Chachma. Chochma would be the seed. It's like you're making matzah, you're making challah, you have a dough. From that dough, you build the whole thing. So chachma would be the dough from where the whole thing is created. That's what would be, that's what would be the, uh, but, but anything beyond chachma is not engaged, not involved. But we learned in the discourse, no, that if Hashem were to create only from chachma and evolve, so to speak, his energy through the whole seder of Ishtal Shalut and creating all the worlds, there would be one thing lacking in the creation. And that would be that things would be very, very fluidy. And things would be very, very, very flimsy. Nothing would be solid and stiff and self-aware. Because everything would be continuously melting into its source. Creation, every level would feel its source and everything would be very... What gives the creation a brute presence of beingness, that does not come from Chachm. That comes from Kesser. Because, why? Because Kesser makes the creation exist in a manner of existence. It turns it into something. It makes it solid. It solidifies the creation to be solid and strong on all levels. Why? Because the, sol- the solidness from the creation comes from the creation being a being without a source. Because if you feel your source, you melt into your source. So the fact, what makes something feel so much itself, because it sees itself as a god, as, as an entity, I, I am, why? Because I am. So from the ore that, that, that is a shaykhist to the world, from the light that has a connection to the creation, then the creations can sense that, and therefore they would... So, the, the, but the ore ain't self, when, since it's ain't self, its interaction, its effect on the world is that it wills something and it happens, but when it happens, it's, what's happening is something totally new, unrelated to the will. Because the will cannot reveal itself in the creation because the will is ain't so. So when, when, it, when it creates, its interaction with the world is in a way of anom- anonymity, completely in an anonymous manner. Meaning completely, not even just anonymous, we don't know who it is, we don't even know that there's someone there doing it. It's like this power, but the power is infinite, so the limited effect that comes from this infinite power, the, the, the power is affecting a limited entity, but because it's limited, it has no relationship to the power, so it's as if this limited effect is affected from nothing. That's why we call it yesh me'ayin, from nothing. It's as if no one pushed it. It gets pushed, imagine being pushed, but without anybody pushing you. So you feel like you flew on your own without being pushed. That's the idea of the Ein Sof. And because its effect on the world is in a level where the, where the effect doesn't know the effector, 
at all, doesn't sense it at all, for that reason, it becomes so self, self-aware, self-conscious. So, and ultimately, ultimately, on the lowest level, self-absorbed. On the highest levels, he says in every level, even on the spiritual levels, there's a certain, and we discussed in the earlier classes, there's a certain weight. The weights that every creation has that weigh it down into itself. Hashem adds weights, like when you throw out a fishing, when you throw out a, a rod, a fishing, a, 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 a line to fish, if, if you just put out the, rod, the, the, the string itself, the, 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 what do they call it, the, the line itself, and, 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 there's, and there's no weight there, then what's going to happen in the water? It's just going to flow on top. So you need, a, you, you need to connect to it a weight, and the weight pulls it down. So the weights that God puts into each creature and every being for it to have gravity and to feel itself and know itself, from the most spiritual being, the, the little bit of self that it has is not coming from the mamale kolalm, and it's not coming from the chachma influence, it's not coming from, the, from where God is a source to the creation, where he himself becomes a source to it, because then there would be a, re- a relativity, and then there would be, that, then you wouldn't feel yesh meyayin, you would feel yesh meyesh, something from something, then the something wouldn't be to something. Because the something, would, it, it, it would be ayin meyesh, everything would feel itself nothing to its source. So the weights that God puts onto it, that's coming from the Soviet Kalalman, that's coming from the infinite, from the Keser. God wants the creation to be this way. Now, its most dramatic effect is where the somethingness and the self and the self-consciousness and the beingness is the most intense. Where is the beingness of the world most intense? In the lowest level, which is the physical. That's why the physical is, the, is most affected by the soul of Kalam. Gewalt. This is such a chiddush. This is so gewalt. You can dance with this forever. This is such an, a gewaltic idea. That dafka the physical, dafka that which feels itself the most, is first cousins with the ain't self, with Keter. The other, the other levels, all the spiritual levels, they are second, third, fourth, fifth, a hundredth cousins. But, but the physical is first cousin. <laughs> Why? Because it's most affected by that power. The higher worlds are more affected by the condensed light. They, the condensed light play more of a role in its, in, its, in its formation. But when it comes to the physical, the condensed light is very minute. And the infinite light is very, 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 very effective. However, so number one, that makes the finite, that makes the physical world very special. Why is it so special? Because it is so ignorant. <laughs> so it is ignorant, its specialty is its ignorance. But it's only special when it can become enlightened in its ignorance. <laughs> but if it remains ignorant, then what is it? It's created to be infinitely separated from its source, and that itself is its connection. Oh. So imagine if you can take that physical entity that is created to be infinitely removed from its source and therefore take itself so seriously and, and, and connect it to its source in a way that it can know its source or attach itself. Have not just a negative connection to its source because according to this, it's a negative connection. It's the fact that it doesn't, it, it's in the know. It does not know its source. And in the no, I don't mean no knowledge. I mean negative. It's in it's 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 very connection to the orain self is how distant it is, and only God can create something so distant from Him, can have such a effect so far away from Him. So that that that's a that's that's a compliment, but it is a a shameful compliment. <laughs> What I mean to say is, it's a very non-proud to be confident, a compliment. It, 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 the compliment is that it is, it is affected by the Ain Self. But the, but the shame of it is that it will never know the Ain Self. It doesn't even know anything creating it, it only knows of itself. It makes it be so ridiculously stupid. <laughs> so, in that sense, like what do you get? Oh, but that's the beauty of a mitzvah. If you can take away the anonymity, the anonymity and reveal its connection to that infinite place, but in a positive manner, not in a negative manner, why? 
Because when God created the physical world to be so anonymous, I'm sorry, for him to be anonymous from the creation that he's creating, from him to be hidden from that which he is creating, what was his intention? His intention is that it can get a chance to discover him. That was his intention. And to serve him. Now to serve him, you have to be able to be a being that has a self which doesn't exist in the higher worlds. They don't have a self because they are so conscious of their source. So only the physical has a self and can ignore God. But the intention is not, it's, the, the, the purpose was there should be a being who could ignore him, but that will not ignore him. So the moment this creature gets enlightened, turns around and serves its creator, then who is it serving? not the limited, metamorphosized level of the divine. It's serving God Almighty, the infinite being himself. And it's expressing the infinite being in its existence. Because now, instead of it, instead of it being connected to the Ein Sof because it's the most concealing on him, it's now connecting to the Ein Sof through revealing him, not concealing him. Like we discussed last week, we gave this whole discussion about, and then two weeks ago, but in the last week, like, you know, from, 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 from this material being a machitza, from it being a barrier, from it being a, 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 a absolute barrier, the material physical world is, an abs- is created through, an, through a barrier of ain't self. That very, very distance, that very, very space becomes the keli, becomes the vessel through what, what captures him and expresses him. When will it be? It's so, but it's still not revealed. So when you do a mitzvah, what are you saying? What are you saying? You're saying that your existence is here. Or when you do a mitzvah with it. And he says this is primarily when you fashion things into a mitzvah. Remember? When we take physical objects and we fashion them into a mitzvah, even when you don't do the mitzvah with them. Yet, but as soon as you made it into a fashion, you, you set aside the, the four species, or you take flour and you make it into matzah, or you take flour and you make it into hamantash. So you're celebrating Purim. You're celebrating something godly with the materials of the world. So you're calling God's name on it. So what you're doing is you're revealing Hashem instead of concealing Him. But which level of God are you revealing? You're revealing the, the ain't self because that's, that's the God of this, of this object. I don't want to use the words that there is a different God. Chas uh, It's one God, but different, different expressions of Him. So the, 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 the godliness of all the spiritual worlds is only, the, is only a tiny little fraction of a fraction of a fraction. It's only a little bit of his light. That's the metamorphosis of his light. That's the godliness expressed in all the sublime, glow, glowing worlds of heaven. But in the brute, coarse, material aspects of the material, of, of the lowly world, of the most physical, the most ignorant of worlds, when, it, when you call God's name, by revealing Hashem's relationship with it, you're, re- you're revealing the God who's creating it. And the will and the will of Hashem is the will of the infinite. It's not the will of the from Seder Ishtal Shalos. It's the will from beyond Seder Ishtal Shalos, from the Ein Sof, who wills this, wills the physical to express it. The mitzvah. So therefore the mitzvah from being, is, 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 is talk about metamorphosis, it's taking something from being the most distant from God, making it the most expressive of God. Now, today's day, we only express the idea in concept that it is an expression of the Ein Sof. But we don't feel the infinite energy in it. We don't see the Ein Sof. We don't feel the adrenaline of God's infinite light pumping in something. Oh, but it's kept in a vessel. It's... it's it's, it's, it's na- the physical object has now become a container holding this light for the day when it will be revealed. When will it be revealed? When Mashiach will come. So all the godliness of our mitzvahs, the lights will turn on and the experience of the Ein Sof will happen during the time. And that's why we know that the revelations that are going to happen in the physical world in the time of Mashiach, primarily by the resurrection of the dead, is going to be far superior to all that which is revealed in heavens and the heavens above. And that's why all souls will come back down here. So that's called the garment. Yavu Malchus. 
Because this element of the Ein Sof we discussed earlier, where, where, where the Ein Sof is relating to creation. The fact that the Ein Sof is relating, now we, you see, understand something. When Hashem already leaps and jumps and makes that infinite jump, or as we said earlier, metamorphosizes to become a source of creation, then he, that, from that vantage point, the creation is important. And the creation has significance, and we might say the creation is something. After all, he himself is a source for that something. And that's, on that level, we say God is a source for the creation. For example, the spherot. That's what the spherot are. The spherot are the building blocks of the creation. The divine, the divine um, um, blueprint of, the crea- of what later is going to become the world, that's the spherot. So you can't say on that level that creation is absolutely nothing. But the whole reason God has structured himself into that structure is so that he can create a creation. So if in the level of Atsilos and the levels of Spheris, uh, the worlds have some value and significance. However, from the level of Ein Sof, before he makes that leap, anything finite is meaningless, is zero. The creations are absolutely nothing. If that's the case, what are we saying even now that from that level he wants, he's creating it. We're saying from the level of Kesser, from the level of Ein Sof, he's creating the world. He's giving it its beingness. He's creating it to be Yesh Me'ayin. He's affecting it, and primarily the physical. But on that level, why is he even paying attention? Why is he even creating if it's, if it's utterly meaningless? The answer is, he garbs himself into a garb of pride. That's the idea. It's a concealment. That's true. He's playing a game with himself. On that level, there really is no value at all, but he covers and conceals that truth before he mitigates. It's not in a mitigated level. It's a level of Ein Sof. But in a level of Ein Sof that he, he garbs, just like when a person wears a garment, what does a garment do? It covers who they really are. It covers their body. So God covers his truth that he is and there's none but him. And once he covers that truth, he can, so to speak, play around with a world. He can imagine himself being a king over a world. That's called Malchus the Ainsof. And that's why Malchus is called the garment. Because the moment he stops play, he stops imagining, the moment he, start, he starts getting real, if God starts getting real, the whole, the whole thing is over. So he purposely conceals his, 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 his MS so that he can, from that level, create a world that will take itself seriously. And he plays king with it. And that's the meaning of why it's called A. And what's his pleasure? His pleasure is that he exalts himself over those worlds. He is the king over them, and he's waiting for them to serve him. He's waiting for them to, 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 because this is the game that he decided to play that gives him pleasure. But it's the, because it's a, a, a lavush, because it's a garment concealing him, it's the last level of the Ein Sof. It's still Keser, it's still Ein Sof. This is, I think, a very important distinction to make over here. We're not talking about Chachma. Chachma is already a whole new story. Chachma is already Hashem taking the quantum leap and entering into already a place where he becomes, God mitigates himself. On the level where he mitigates himself, he doesn't need a garment for the worlds to be special. The worlds are special and significant without a garment. But on the level of Ein Sof, his relationship with the world has to be through a screen and a filter that, that, that is hiding his MS because on this level there is no creation. There cannot be anything but him. So he hides that truth. And, 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 and the he and the Ein Sof that is present and active after that garment. In other words, his appearance, it's as soon as Purim. So on Purim, you, you can be two people. You're you, but you're also, you're, you're acting the, 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 the costume you. 
the pretending you. And, you're, and if you're a good pretender, you don't just put on a costume, but you play the role of that entity. So when the Abish there, so how much of you is in that role that you're playing? How deep do you get involved in that? Usually not too much. You, you play it a little bit. So it's like an external type of a game as you're playing, you're playing that, that role. So by God, it's also, it's an external element of the Ein Sof. It's only an R of the Ein Sof. And that's where the entire power of, of to create the world from the Ein Sof is in the Malchus of the Ein Sof. And that's called Lavush Malchus. And we also learned that because it's only a Lavush, because it's a, pre, it's a pretense, because it's a concealment on his truth, it's something that we constantly have to stir up in him. He's depending on us to keep him engaged. He's very easily can drift away from that game. Game over, chas v'shalom. And in order that he doesn't drift away from the game, by continuously us making mitzvahs, we're not yet talking about doing the mitzvahs. We're talking about making items for mitzvahs, taking a hide and making it to fill in, making it Torah, making uh, wool into, into, into tzitzis, uh, making whatever, all the stuff that we, that we do mitzvahs with, by just fashioning them into the mitzvah, that's already driving, we play, when we play, he's not going to play if nobody's playing along. <laughs> that's basically the idea. If no one is playing along in his game, if no one is into his shtick, it's like people, will only, people only continue a certain entertainment if there's anybody being entertained. <laughs> so, of course, everybody is, everybody's playing along in the sense that what? Wow, that we're creations and we're, and, we're, and we're running our businesses, our lives, we're, we're, we're making and doing. But that's not his game. That's our game. His game is when we're playing along with him, when we're playing ping pong with him. In other words, when we acknowledge his existence in this charade of creation, charade of creation. And that's by doing what? Taking him seriously. Asking him, what do you want? Plugging into God and finding out what does God want in, 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 this, in, 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 in the world. Oh, God has a will. What is his will? So the rabbis sit and probe all day long. What's God's will? Trying to extrapolate it from a code that he gave us, the Torah, which is a very, very, very uh, cryptic code. And we're trying to figure out the will of the Ein Sof. And when we engage in him and we, and, we, and, we, and we take him seriously, we're playing with him. And that itself keeps that garment. That's why it says, let them bring the garment. Yaviu, it needs to be brought to him constantly. Because if we stop playing, he also stops playing. Which wouldn't be good. Then we learned last week as well, but even deeper than that. In addition to keeping him engaged, there is also evoking the deepest pleasure that he should want to escape. In other words, it's one thing to continue a game with someone. And once you're playing, you're playing it. And now I understand the difference of last week. I didn't understand this in the class. I, it just hit me now. What's the difference which he says that by fashioning the object to the mitzvah, continuously you're getting Hashem engaged. And but when we're doing the mitzvah, we're drawing down the crown. What's crown? that we're going much deeper into the Ein Sof, instead of engaging the Malchut of the Ein Sof, we're, ga- we're, we're engaging the Keter of the Ein Sof. What's the Keter? Keter is always pleasure. The pleasure of the Ein Sof is the highest level of the Ein Sof. And that's when we do the mitzvahs. Because that's when, it this says this week in the Parsha by Parsha Vayikra, it says, Nachas Ruach Lefanai. God says, what kind of pleasure does he get from the sacrifices? Not from the smell of barbecue meat. Nachas ruach it is a delight before me. She'omarti, I spoke, v'nasa ritzayni, and my will was, was being done. I get a kick out of the fact, God says, that I am being taken seriously. I wanted something, and it was done. That's, and he enjoys. But it gives him a sensation, gives him a pleasure. And that's his crown. So what's the difference then between, between um, bringing the lavush, which means stimulating the malchut itself and evoking the crown? We said stimulating the malchus is by the objects of the mitzvah. Evoking the crown, the pleasure, is when we do the mitzvah. In other words, it's one thing to prepare the tefillin and make the tefillin. 
It's another thing someone goes and purchases the tefillin and puts on the tefillin every day, dons the tefillin. Or, 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 or affixes the mezuzah to the door. Or eats the matzah on Pesach night. Or blows the shofar. Or reads the Megillah on Purim. That creates an enormous thrill in the orient self on the levels of Kesser. What's the difference? The difference is simple. Once someone committed to a game, how long will they play? They will play as long as someone is playing with them. So if, if I show up at a ping pong uh, table, and as long as I have a partner playing with me, I'll play. But that doesn't mean that that's good enough for me to get my get out, get, to leave my, my, the comfort of my, of my own couch where I'm reading and this thing, go play ping pong. To get me out of my couch and leave my place and to go to the, to the, to the, to the outside and to, find, and, and to go to the, the hall where the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the board game is or whatever the, 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 the thing is, that I need to have someone to really evoke that kind of a pleasure. If it's my child that wants to play with me, I have pleasure in my child, I go, it's a good friend that I want to spend time with, I'm going to go there. That's much deeper, you have to stir a pleasure. Once you're there already, you're going to continue playing as long as someone engages you. If no one is there, then you're going to leave. So there's two levels of there. Let's say you left already and you went back home. You finished playing for the day and someone wants you to play. They better revoke something deeper in you to get you back into the game. Right? They say, well, let's talk about something that you, know, you mentioned to me last week, your idea in business. Oh, you're, you're talking about my business idea. I'm going to come back and let's play. We'll play. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do another round. Because you provoked something deeper to come. Once they're playing already, then you still need provocation, but that's only you need someone to engage with you. And that's what <coughs> I'm seeing now is the difference between the fashioning of the mitzvahs that's keeping, once he's in the, once he's in the levush malchus, he's, there's someone there responding to it, to his kingship. Someone is acknowledging that he's the king. That's necessary. But deeper than that, the sensation that he gets to want him even, that evokes the desire that he should even want to play this game, is the crown that we do. And even though we do the mitzvahs, this is the last point we learned last week, even though we do, even though we do the mitzvahs with what? With the material, physical things of this world. And how in the world does that relate to God's crown? We're, doing, we're, do, we're taking physical objects of the physical world. So we said, take a look at a king. The entire kingdom is energized by the king's crown. And we understand. What do we understand? That in this world, what, what is there? In, in, in any country, what's there? In any, in any uh, I'm talking about Achashverosh. He was the king of Persia, 127 countries. What was in his country? A lot of stones. A whole lot of stones, a whole lot of earth, inanimate object. I don't know how much grain of sand there is on all over Persia. And all the stone and all the, all the minerals, every, a lot. And then there is the plants. What's more impressive? The plants than the inanimate object. And what's even more impressive than all the trees, plants, and different that all over is the kingdom of Achashverosh. What's more impressive is the animals. Higher. And you want to know, what is the, what is the national animal of Persia? Like what is the what, what kind of animals does it have? What kind of, and then in there the other Persians themselves, the people, the people of the empire, they have wisdom, they have they have, they have knowledge, they're sophisticated. And the people, that's what it's really that's really where it's at. Amongst the people, there are the officials and the other uh, the higher officials and the other governors, and the and the and the and the aristocrats and the noblemen and the king's inner advisor, and then there is the king himself. In the king himself, what's the highest part of the king? His head. The, the king's body, the king's toes are also the king's toes. The king's toes are higher than the heads of everyone else. Right? That's the way it is. And that, the king's head. But what's the highest, 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 highest thing in the kingdom? Beyond the king's head, the crown. Because <laughs> the king is only the king with his crown. And what's inside the crown? The jewels. And what are the jewels? What are the jewels? The stones. So we, you get the lowest thing. Man, that, 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 you were wondering, where am I going with this? Why am I talking about the Persian king? We went all the way to the top. We went to the highest power, to the highest point. But what's on top of the king's head? The crown. Where the crown is made up of what? Of the stones. Of the jewels. And the, oh, the polished. But these are not regular stones. These are polished stones. 
These are brilliant stones. These are, and they make up the thing. So the law, and the same is with God's empire. God got the highest, deepest, above God's head, so to speak, on the highest places, is our physical mitzvahs. The lowest from the material, the lowest material of the lowest world. The inanimate objects of the world. The parchment, the wool. This is all physicality, pure physicality. But they're shining brilliantly because they're God's will. Do you know what it means to make tzitzis out of wool? Do you know what it means to make tefillin out of, out of things? To make uh, a Shabbos candle out of, out of wax or, or oil and, and do, reveal Shabbos, God's mitzvah? These are the stones in God's creation. That's the pleasure that drives the entire empire, the entire kingdom. So this is what we learned review till now. We didn't learn yet what the horse is. We're going to get to that. And now he's going to connect it even stronger to, whole, to the whole Purim story. And we will read that today. Okay. Based on this, we understand how high mitzvahs are. Now again, what is the connection to Purim to all this? Because that's when we accepted to do the mitzvot. So the mitzvot were again revealed in the world during the time of Purim. Because our connection to these very mitzvot were very shaky. That means that on our end we were not so connected to his mitzvot. And, and, and if our end it was shaky, then in God's end it was also shaky. Because to whatever degree we engage in it, that's how much he engages. It's, it's all, it's a relationship. Ubakolze, you have a Maimar Rizal, with all this we'll understand what the sages say. Gaval, this is Gavaldic learning that we're going to learn today. Kol Anaviyam Asidim Lehi Botel. It says that all the prophets in the days of the future, in the Mashiach and Messianic times, all the prophets are going to become void and null. All the prophets are going to become as if they're not. Chutz Memegilas Esther. Besides, simply the simple understanding of that is what the Talmud is saying is that all the 24 books of Scripture besides the five books of Moshe, but all the other books, so 24 minus is 19, and then minus one more, 19 minus one, and 18 books of Scripture are going to be deleted when Mashiach comes. We're not going to be part in the future world. I don't know if Mashiach or Tchias HaMesim, it's out, not here anymore, unnecessary. But, uh, but um, uh, Megillah's Esther is going to be the one book that we're going to f- we're going to have it in our bookcase. We're going to study it. We're going to learn it, and we're going to read it on Purim forever and ever. Shanamar, as it says, Purim and the days of Purim, these days of Purim, Lo Yavru. Where did the sages take it from? Because it says Lo Yavru, they will never ever be removed from the Jewish people. Purim will never be canceled. We're living in a canceled generation where everybody, everybody cancels everything. But Purim will not be canceled. It will defy all cancellations. And then there's one more thing that won't be canceled. The laws of the Torah won't be canceled. Which means the Torah, but which part of Torah? So again, large chunks of Torah will be canceled because the, the prophets will be canceled. Scripture will be canceled. Five books of Torah will not be canceled. And the laws of Torah. So maybe some other aspects of Torah will also be canceled, but not the final laws. So where you get halacha psukah like Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law, Rambam, which is final halacha, the halachos of Torah will be relevant forever and ever. Chen halacha is eni betelis, will not be deleted. So again, the thought then is that they will be gone. They will be actually they, they, we, 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 if you look for them, you won't find them. They'll be uh, canceled and disappear. But he says you can't say that. Well, the Havin in Yabitl Anavim to understand what this means. One thing is for sure we see that the Megillah Sester is super special. So, but Allah Havin in Yabitl Anavim and to understand the concept of the Nevi'im being coming nullified. A Nakavan al Bitl Anavua. Now, one can read it wrong and think that that means that there won't be any more prophecy. Prophecy will come to an end. He says, because it says that the, the Nevi'im will be canceled, which means no more prophets. He says, on the contrary, then prophets will be a dime a dozen. Everybody will be a prophet. Prophecy is going to increase way more than there ever was. 
So it's not, that's not what it means, profits will be cut. That, the, that prophecy will secede from the Jewish people. Because on the contrary, the spirit of prophecy will, be, will, be, will increase be Yisrael amongst the Jewish people. God will spill out his spirit. The spirit of prophecy will come pouring forth on all flesh. That means you won't have to be the biggest tzaddik to be a prophet. Because everybody will be a, uh, enough of a tzaddik to be a prophet. And your sons and daughters will be prophets. As the verse also says, All of them know me. Everybody will know me. What's a prophet? Someone who knows God much more than, but then everybody will know him. What, the, what then does it mean? That the godly revelation that there is to the prophets, prophecy will continue. And not only that, prophecy will spread to everybody. But it won't be a big deal. It's like in the early days when, um, when the internet just, just came rolling off. So it was like a big deal if someone had a connection. It was like a major, oh, you come to someone and someone, it was like not everybody had it. A few people were the first ones to have it. You would go to their office and they would dial in. You would hear the dial. It would dial and dial and it would catch on. And then you would see the pale girl and everybody stood with their open mouths. Whoa, I remember them visiting someone. I uh, it must have been out for a while, but for me it was like I was standing with gaping mouth. Like, wow, you can click here and go here. And it was like crazy. Because it was like, and then the entire world has access to the internet. Everybody, even the, even in the most backward countries, even in the third world countries. Because everybody has it. So it's no big, big deal. So prophecy is gonna be so come become so common that it's gonna be it's gonna be cheap. It's not even gonna be something, okay? So so you know what's what's a prophet, someone who can see what's going on in the higher realms. In the spiritual world, someone who can, who can read energy and all these stuff. It's going to be, what? You know the weather. There you go, yeah. <laughs> People will know, forecast the weather, forecast events that are going to happen, but everybody's going to be able to do it because we're going to have access to much higher levels of consciousness and higher awareness, and we tune in to the higher realms, and it's not going to be special. So again, it's, it's not going to be special because it's going to be so common. And that's what it means it's going to be canceled because it's going to be so common. But, but more, moreover, is that there is going to be something revealed in the world that's even much greater than prophecy. And since it's going to be much greater than prophecy, so the fact that you're a prophet, the prophecy will for sure be canceled because the, 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 the energy of prophecy will be considered small change compared to the higher revelation of godliness that's going to be which is higher than prophecy. Um, if the king is living in your home, the king himself is living in the home, it's no big deal that you have a connection to the king through a phone. Imagine someone takes out their phone and they show you that they have, I don't know, let's take you know a big knocker. They have the numbers of the three, four, five, or ten richest people, Forbes magazine, they have Elon Musk's number, and they have uh, the guy from uh, from Amazon. What's his name? He has a cell phone number. I'm not going to show you. I'm gonna ha I can call him anytime. Like I'm a knocker. Imagine you have access to such important people, such powerful people, such influential people. Um, but then what happens? The child of of this guy. He doesn't need the, I have my father's number. I live in my father's house. <laughs> my father lives the next, he's, <laughs> I live with him daily. When God himself is going to move into this world, the fact that some people can communicate with the higher worlds or with the higher revel or godly, so what? That's the idea that the prophets will become outdated. There will be even more prophets. But, 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 but what's, what will be the big deal? That's what he's explaining. Yeah, but uh, but you know, even if you know what's going to happen tomorrow, but okay, you know, you 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 have the one who's controlling everything living in your house. <laughs> so what's the say? Which is going to be in the future? Actually, a bottle 
it will become it will be nullified like the nullification and the integration ziv hashemesh b'shemesh of the rays of the sun that are in the sun. See, the, to have a sun ray is a big deal. The sun rays are really good. They give us light, they give us warmth. But when you're in the sun itself, imagine if you can tolerate it, if you're in the sun itself, then the, 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 the rays of light of the sun are utterly insignificant to you because you have the sun itself, which is the source of the sun ray. And even though, so here's what he's saying in the Gevald. He says the sun rays are really much stronger when they're in the sun. Because the moment the ray leaves the sun, it starts getting a little weaker. Light gets weaker the farther it travels. So we can imagine that the rays of the sun while they're in the sun are far more potent than when they leave the sun. Especially light years and light years away, they are much weaker than when they're in the sun. They are much hotter and much brighter in the sun. Yet in the sun, no one pays attention to the rays. As hot and as bright as they are, it's still nothing compared to the sun itself. So what it's going to be like this. Prophecy in the days of Mashiach, they're not just going to be prophets. The prophets then are going to be a million times bigger than the prophets of the past. <laughs> Why? Because it's going to be the rays of the sun in the sun. So those prophets are going to be super prophets. Mega prophets. Super prophets, mega prophets. I like this. Um, but yes, so prophecy, it's not just going to be also prophets. It'll be much bigger prophets, but it's still going to be, a, it's still going to be, it's still going to be insignificant. Uh, because the, the sun rays are much stronger in the sun than, than the light that shines down on earth from the sun. In its source, literally in the sun, it's insignificant. Because of the sun, it's the light, the essential light that's in the body of the sun. Because the light of the sun globe itself is much more and much greater than any kind of ray. Since it's the source and the root of these rays, of the rays of the sun. What's prophecy? Rays of divine, of divine light. Divine lights that shine. So we're going to see the godly radiance that shines in the upper worlds. That's what a prophet access, accesses. A prophet is able to climb up to a higher dimension of existence and peek around, snoop around in a higher world. Like it says, Rabbi Yishmol, you know, Rabbi Yikiv, on, on Yom Kippur we say it. It's a sad story when we see about Rabbi Yishmol purified himself in Ba'ala Lamarom and he went up to the higher realms and he snooped around to find out if the decree was a real decree coming from God or if, it, if there's any validity to what the Roman uh, king wanted to do and kill them ten martyrs, right? That's one story. Then you have the Baal Shem Tov going up on Rosh Hashanah. He says, I went up, I did Aliyah's Nisham, I lifted my soul up to the higher worlds and I snooped around until I got into Mashiach's place. And I spoke to Mashiach. That's what prophets do. They move around in the higher realms and they get act, they get information. Not all the information that is known in the upper worlds is known down here. Like we, we told the story the, the night when we had the, 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 the story about Rabbi Gershon of Kitov. So remember, we told the story how the Baal Shem Tov sent him a letter <laughs> about an event that didn't happen yet. And he said, this happened to you because of this. And then Rav Gershon says to him, well, it's a true story, but when you wrote the letter, it hadn't happened yet. <laughs> and the answer is because the Baal Shem Tov was able to tune into that event in a higher realm where time is still before it happened down here. It was already an occurrence up there. That's where prophets do. So they know things because they're in an upper world. But what's the upper world? There's, there's higher rays of godly light and more divine information in those worlds. But that's not God. It's godly lights. Mashiach will come. God will move in down here. God himself is moving down here. He's moving into this world. He's... Um, Bechinah's gili... We'll, 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 we'll see when, he, when he comes. Bechen kol bechinah's gili oir ha-nevuah she And therefore all the light of nevuah of prophecy. 
that's of the prophets, Asidim li bottle, are going to become nullified, Ulihi kolel, and become absorbed, Ba'ira atzmi, in the essential light. Which light is this? Shubchenas atzmus oirein soif. Not the rays of the orange sof, not the rays of the infinite of the of the infinite light, but the infinite light itself, the infinite being himself. Mamish, she is He will be revealed laosid, and Hashem Himself is going to be revealed in the future. Shem emenu nimtzom akoyra oyra leki, which from Him He is the source from which Him stems the godly light. Ham is gala that is that is revealed to the prophets. Ekamoshakosa, like it says, ki imcha makor chayim. It says, with you is the source of life. That means all life that later manifests in the creation. All life, all energy, and all living, all life force that's, that's, that, that's giving life to all of existence, you are the source of it. It's all drawn from you. So if I have you, I don't need these lights. V'zehu kol anavihim. V'zehu kol anavihim. It's like, you know, do I have to read your book? If if I can I can sit and, and study with you yourself, I don't have to read your book. For people who don't who can't study with you or can't meet the teacher or whatever, okay, they're gonna read the teacher's book. But I I'm with the teacher himself. So why do I need the book? That's the Nikuda. We're with God himself. Why do we need his 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 light? And this is the idea that all the prophets are see them are gonna become nullified. Megillas Esther, besides the book of Esther. Why the scroll of Esther is different? The answer is because the scroll of Esther is God himself. All the books of the prophecy are only lights of God. But Megillah's Esther, that's God himself. That's what he's going to explain now with a lengthy explanation. And therefore, it, it's going to be significant even in the days of Mashiach. We're soon going to see that Megillah's Esther is even higher than what's going to be in the future. And it reveals itself in Purim. That's why it's going to be exciting when Purim comes. If it's, if it's God himself, but God is going to be every day, so then why do I have to be excited about Purim? Within God himself, it's the... It's, the, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's that which is the most hidden and the most hidden of God, and that reveals itself in Purim. And therefore, Purim is going to be a, a very, very noticeable day, even in the future. And we're going to grab the Megillah and we're going to open it up because we're going to experience in the Megillah what we don't experience on a regular day, a regular Mashiach day. A regular Mashiach day, daily, daily living in the days of Mashiach is more worth than all the prophets. But not Megillah Sester. Megillah Sester is a treasure even in the times of Mashiach. And that very same pre- treasure, we read it tomorrow night, to, uh, two nights from now. We actually will read it, hear it, right? We will hear it, read it. Cool. Ha'inyan hu, the idea is as follows. Ki amenazal, the sages say, Esther minatayra minayin. The secret to all of this is that the sages say, Esther, where is she mentioned in the Torah? Because we know that everything must be hinted to in the five books of the Torah. Even though Esther herself is the Torah, but we know that the five books is the source of the whole Torah. So everything that will happen later has to be sourced in the Chumash itself. So the sages wonder, where is there a source to Esther, to Queen Esther? And the sages answer, Shanemar, it says, there's a verse, a very tr- seemingly troubling and hard verse. It says, God says, I will hide my face in that day. Hashem says, then that day will come, I will hide my face. And in those words, hastir, astir, I will hide, I will hide, double hiding, that means they're very hidden, which is referring about the dark days of exile. The Torah is alluding to the story of Purim. So on the simple level, because Esther became queen during a very, 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 during a very dark time in Jewish history. How, how dark was it? It was one of the only times when there was a literal threat of complete annihilation of the entire Jewish people. Oops. 70 years ago, 80 years ago, we had a similar th- moment of the, div- of the highest divine concealment, which was during the Holocaust. Only difference is then, during the Holocaust, 
it almost came to fruition. And by the Purim, it, 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 all that happened was the scare itself. It didn't, it didn't move forward. So in a sense, what we experienced 70 years ago was even more Esther. That's why we understand when the Rebbe says that when it comes to the Holocaust, it's so sacred, it's so beyond understanding that we shouldn't try to give any explanation to it. Because it's like, if you understand that if we say that, that Esther is like, it's the biggest divine concealment, but precisely because of that, it's the highest, as we're going to see. So, so, but from the first reading, it would seem, so w- where's Esther in the Torah? Esther in the Torah is that there will be a time of tremendous darkness. But, so that's only signifying the no, not the yeah. It's only signifying the, the, the distance, the, the, the loneliness. But we know that part of the Purim story is not just the loneliness. That from the darkness came the light. So we have to say, that. so what, what should we cherish about Purim? Should we cherish about Purim? It was dark and then it became light. Oh, so Bar Hashem, it became light. God saved us with a miracle. What we're going to see is that we have to cherish in Purim both, both the darkness and the light. Why? Because the period of darkness superficially it means great distance great separation great great being in a very 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 lowly pathetic state of existence exile at its peak it happened at the end of exile again similar to our generation october 7th same story simchas torah holiest, happiest day, such a bloodbath. God forbid. It's like, it's, it's like such concealment, you've never seen such concealment. The concealment of concealments. Astir, astir, concealment. But we're going to see that the concealment is what he's going to explain over here is really... is really way above and beyond all the good times and the revelations. On a very deep, essential level, we're connecting in the concealment way, way deeper than we connect in the times of lights. But that's half the story, the concealment. Then from the concealment comes the what? Comes the miracle. And the miracle is the revelation. But revelation doesn't mean, okay, no more concealment, back to the light. Revelation means that that which, w- that which we tapped in the concealment, the deepest and the highest and the core essence, that itself revealed itself. So then we're not just back to light. It's the essence revealed. So had we never gone into the darkness, then we would always remain externally connected to God on a very external level. It would be light, it would be bright, it would be rays, it would be prophecy. What was before, what was before Esther? The temple. What was during the time of the temple? Prophecy. What prophecy? God was engaging with us through his lights, through his emanations. And we were sensitive to communicate to those emanations. And everybody was living in a very godly life, but it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't essence. It was superficial. So we had to go through the darkness, and in the darkness, it becomes, it becomes harsh. It becomes difficult. But those moments are the moments that eternally we will enjoy. Because from those darkest moments come the deepest and highest bond. And it's never the same afterwards. 
It's back. When we bring it to revelation, it's not back to the, to the, to the lights. It's, it's, it's bond up essence to essence. Let's read. Esther from the Torah. Where do we know that? Shenemar. It says, astir astir by ponai. I will hide my face. By Oimahu on that day. So now he's going to look at those words. I know you've been learning this also in the. My daughter was teaching a mimer of Bayoimahu. So here he's going to again go along those lines. Bayoimahu lashen nistar. When it says on that day, it's it's it's. Um, Referring to a hidden dimension. He's going he's to say, I'm going to give you a little preview. He's going to say, by who means a hidden revelation. Yoim is revelation. And who means him. So when, you, when do you say him? Or when do you say that? Let's, let's talk about that. That that thing it's not here because if it was in front of you what would you say this thing the fact that you're saying that thing means that you're talking about something that's not here so by who means what a day that day means a revelation that's not in front of us that's that so what does that mean in the time of the temple, there was revelations of godliness down here. And therefore, in the time of the temple, it was called Bayom Hazeh, on this day. Because the revelation, the Yom, the godly light, was Zeh, you can point. Like when they went through the Yamsu, they said, Zeh Keli, this is my God. In the Beis Amigdash, you can come and you can see the ten miracles that happened in the Beis Amigdash. You can see God, that's called Bayom Hazeh, this day. So what does Bayeimahu mean? Bayeimahu means a higher, a place of revel, a, a revelation, but a revelation in a hidden world. What's referred to in Hasidic terminology, it's called Alma de Iskasia, the concealed worlds, higher realms. And that's the difference between the time when the temple was standing and the time of the exile. The time when the temple was standing, the divine revelation, God's face, His panai, His face, came down by Yoim Hazeh in this, it was a revelation, Hazeh in this world. But during the time of exile, God says, I'm going away from the Zeh reality, from your world Zeh down here, and I'm, 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 I'm going to hide in that world, in a higher world. Now, at least when we had prophets, so the prophets were able to go into the who, <laughs> into the higher world and sneak peek and bring us some information from it. But in the time of the of Purim story, the prophecy was kind of coming, was drying up. There was come out no prophets anymore. You looked for the prophets, they weren't here. So whoever was living in the Zer world, which is all of us, was in the complete darkness. And where was God? By Yomahu in a higher realm. That's what he's explaining. Kiyadu, as it is known, Shakal Hu Lashanister. Whenever it says who, it means concealed. And what does it mean on, the, on that day? These means the concealed worlds, the lawyers, Galian, these are worlds that are not revealed. God was revealed in heaven, but he was not revealed on earth. Because the Shekhinah, when the Shekhinah is in exile, Ba'ayin Sarim in the 70 ministering angels, Nikra Esther. That's when the Shekhinah is called Esther. But hold it. And then now the question becomes, hold it. If, 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 if Esther is referring to God, let's get, this, let's get this a little clear. If Esther is referring to God, because when it says, Vanoichi Aster Aster, who's hiding? Shem is hiding. We're asking Esther. So Esther is a human being down here. She was our queen. Or the queen, of, she was the, right, the Jewish woman who became the queen of Achashverosh. So she is where? She's down here. But we're saying God is hiding. So Esther should have been where? <laughs> Somewhere in the higher realm. She should have been hiding up there. What is she doing down here? Not only is she down here, but she's trapped in the king's palace. She doesn't want to be there even. She's not just she's here. 
Okay, if Esther would be here and she would be in the in the ladies section lighting candles for the mayor Ben Abalanes, I'm picturing one of the Sephardi woman lighting candles for the mayor Balanes and for the uh, for the Baba Sali. And uh, I see I see the woman sitting around uh, there in Tiberias. It's, it's just an image I'm getting. Uh, with the <laughs> I'm saying a holy a holy Babushka Rebetzin, uh whatever that she's in some uh, no where is she. She's dragged away to the palace of the king, a Gentile king. She's living in sin. <laughs> Think about it. She's living with a non-Jew. She has to have material relationships with him. She's, she's sinning. So hold on, what is it? The Shekhinah is hiding. Esther is the Shekhinah and she's hiding. In the higher worlds, both are true. What does that mean? During the time of exile, two things are happening. The Jewish people go to exile. Together with, today we gave a whole class worth listening to. you got to listen to these classes that I'm giving during the week. They're called, um, now this one that I'm learning, it's called Ground Zero, the point of entry of Mashiach. It's fascinating classes. In general, all these classes I'm doing, the key, the key, they called Key to Redemption, is a must learn. Today I gave the hundredths, I forgot to mention it in the class in the morning. It was the hundredths of that series, the hundredth class of that series. That's a milestone. Three digits. But in any case, over there we were talking about um, the concept that when the Jewish people go to exile, God follows them in exile. The Shekhinah goes along with exile. So now we have to make sense of this. On the one hand, we're saying that during the time of exile, God hides. He's hiding in a higher world. That means Hashem departs from this world and He goes up to an upper world. But on the other hand, we say that during the time of exile, God comes along with us into the exile. In the, the words of the Kabbalists, they, there, there is Talmudic words and the Zoharic words. In the Talmud, in the, in the, in the Talmud world, it's Galu Edom Shechina Imahem. Galu Bavel Shechina Imahem. The Jews go to exile, God comes along with them. The Shechina comes along. In the terms of the Zohar, in the terms of the mystics, it calls it Galut HaShchina, the exile of the Shechina. And it says that God is in exile under the Ayin Sarim. What does the Ayin Sarim mean? The 70 ministering angels that take the Shechina into captivity. Who are these 70 ministering angels? These are the, angel, the angels of the Gentile nations who enslave the Jewish people, who take the... Who, who, who abuse, who, who uh, inflict the Jewish people that are in their countries and in their lands. Every nation has an angel above. So when they're inflicting Israel, they're also inflicting the Shekhinah. And that's the meaning that God is under the Shekhinah. Down here, we're under the, 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 the rule of the English king or the Russian czar or the German kaiser or the United States president. Or whoever, whichever country the Jews are. That's down here. A little bit higher than down here, the Shekhinah is under, is, an, is being dragged away. She's being controlled, so to speak, by the ministering angel, which is a spiritual angel above that's not a good guy, who's the angel of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of any particular country. And this angel abuses the Shekhinah, stealing her energy to use it because all energy comes from God. She's stealing the, the energy of the Shekhinah, forcing the Shekhinah to go along and support all of its atrocities. But you cannot imagine the pain of the Shekhinah for that. Imagine during the war, uh, you know, uh, 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 during the Second World War, the, the, you know, the Jewish... The Jewish men and women that have to work in Nazi factories making the uniforms for the soldiers that are killing their brothers and their children. Or making the airplanes that they are knowing that are, that are, that are, that are fighting the war for the Germans. They're going to enable the Germans to go into more Jewish territories and massacre more Jews. But they have no choice. And that's the concept that the Shekhinah is in exile. She is, she's being taken advantage of by these, and she's helpless. Very sad. But hold it, didn't we say earlier that the Shekhinah 
during the time of exile goes higher. Which means she goes away from the world. The answer is like this. The more external, the most external part of the Shekhinah gets dragged into exile together with the Jewish people. The Shekhinah makes her, on per, no one can control the Shekhinah. No one can drag the Shekhinah, abduct the Shekhinah. They can't. But the Shekhinah allows their, herself to be abducted and taken away and dragged away. Why? Because she wants to be with her children. And for whatever divine, great, mysterious plan that we have to take out the sparks of holiness that are amongst these nations. So the Shekhinah goes, goes into exile. But when she goes, she only goes externally. Internally, she recoils and goes into a higher world. The reason for that is, if she would be taken into exile internally as well, that means the entire Shekhinah, the higher elements of the Shekhinah would go into exile, that means she would be giving to the Klippa powers that they should never have. It would be way too dangerous. The Klippas would become, which means the, 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 the ministering angels of the unholy would become so powerful they would never be able to be taken down. Because they would have access to the inner godliness. In order that that shouldn't happen, she puts her inside in a safe box. Her deeper self remains in the higher world. Her external self gets, goes out into the exile. So both these things are true. Her deeper self goes into hibernation. She goes to sleep for the long winter. And her, her, her external self is subjugated to the, to the Klippas. What we are going to talk mainly in this particular talk over here is when she goes higher into hibernation, where is she going? And what's the benefit then of that level? As we're going to see. And how that... Okay? Because the Shekhinah, when she's in exile, but I and in the 70 nations, Nikra Esther, she's then called. So that's true. Esther, the external Esther is where she is the manifestation of the Shekhinah in this world because the Shekhinah went to the king of Persia. Because in heaven, the Shekhinah was dragged away to the, to the, to the angel of Persia. Down here below, a Jewish woman who is a personification of the Shekhinah in this world gets taken to Ahasuerus' palace. See, everything is, mim everything is reflecting in this world. And you think the abduction that happened on October 7th is any different? It's the same story. Jewish women being dragged away. Shekhinah being dragged away into exile. It's one story. Wait, 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 wait. I'm saying, but it was it was um, purposely Jewish women. And 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 the the the, the and, and now you can understand why why it took the UN uh, three months to condemn it. To barely say one word. And why the Me Too movement sits there for in, in the most shameful way and doesn't say a word. And all the so-called women organizations don't say a word. You know why? Because they're all in cahoots with it. They're all in cahoots with this. They're all part of it. Why? Because what's going on over here? What's going on is where the Shekhinah is about to come out of exile. All sparks of holiness is about to be elevated. And they're trying to grab one last grab at it. So you think they're going to support and stand up for these Jewish women? Silently, subconsciously, there is a joy Get her, get them. Because, because subconsciously we're, we're keeping the Shekhinah in exile so that it can, can, she could continue to support unholiness and impurity. I'm giving you a deeper meaning that's taking place that is unknown to all these players. Why they're supporting it. Why they're not outraged. It's for this reason. Like Esther was taken to the palace. But in the end, as we always know, it never works out for the Klippa. The Klippa mistakenly thinks it's going to gain, but they end up losing everything. Even the little bit they once had, even that gets taken away from them. So it's, uh, it's a very, 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 very stupid move on their part. But sometimes they score a temporary victory. They play their part that they're supposed to play. That's it. 
Nikra Esther Shemistatere, she the Shekhinah gets concealed. Umisalemes. So Esther down here, when I say Esther down here, I mean the Shekhinah as she goes, in, the external part of the Shekhinah is called Esther. Why? Esther means concealment, but he's going to point to two levels of concealment. The One part of the concealment is she's concealed by the klipa. In other words, the, she, the, the, the Shekhinah, instead of her being visible in this world, like when she was in the Holy Temple, she's visible, she's now taken, she's now, she's now blocked by the klipas. The klipas are hiding her. Like, <laughs> the same story. Take a look at the Jewish, at these women that were taken into Gaza. When they were in Israel, they were, they, they, they were able to, they, they, they were visible, they were there. Now they're hidden in some dungeon, in some tunnel. It, everything plays out. So Esther, what happens? Instead of her being, or that story of Esther, the Shekhinah, instead of her being visible in the world, is now hidden. We ask, where is God during the, during the dark moments? What's going on? God is camouflaged. He's hidden. And the clippers are covering her. The, the dark forces are covering her. That's why she's called Esther. But that's only her external self. Her deeper self is also called Esther. But not because the clippers are covering her, but because she recoils into herself. She becomes very introverted, very hidden and very, very private, so she's not revealing herself. She's, she's rev- she is entering into a very sacred inner space that's, that's very, very removed from the world. She's returning into herself. She's secluding herself. It's a completely different type of Esther. But they both mean concealment, but two types of concealments. The external concealment is a block on her, and the internal concealment is a, is a retraction. Because the Shekhinah, when she's in exile, by Ayin Sarim, let's go again, Nikra Esther, she's called Esther. The first thing he's explaining is the external part. She becomes concealed, and she becomes hidden in, the, in, in a garment of a sackcloth. The Ayin Sarim of the 70 ministering angels, they're called sackcloth. Just like a sack is not a, an appropriate woman's garment, a woman wears a garment, so the garment is supposed to express her beauty. But when you're wearing a sack, it's covering, it's blocking. So the Shekhinah's light cannot reveal itself when the 70 ministering angels are, are blocking her light. We're not, then she's not enslaved to all 70. She's enslaved to whichever one is turned. They, they take turns, the 70 ministering angels. It, it, it goes through the, very, the places where the Jewish people end up in exile. Va'oz, and then at that very time, Oyle, she rises. Lehisaser, she hides herself. That's not being blocked, but that's her own hiding. Ba'alman Stemen in the concealed worlds, the lawyer's galleon. She hides herself in the higher worlds. Why? Because if God forbid she wouldn't hide herself, then, 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 they, would, then they would have way too much power. And hear these beautiful, I mean, it's painful words, but it's just, Kamoshikosov, like it says, a Pasuk in Shir Hashirim, here's another Pasuk for you for tomorrow. It says in the Pasuk, Yoinasi, my dove, Bechag Ve'aselai, is in the cracks of the rocks. So it's referring, God is referring, is talking about Israel. The man is speaking about the woman, and he calls her my dove, my beautiful bird. And God says to her, to the Shekhinah, He says, you got caught in the cleft of a rock. Simply, Hashem is speaking to the Shekhinah. The masculine side of, of God is speaking to the feminine side of God, the Shekhinah. And He says, during the exile, you got caught in the hands of the Klippas. You got stuck in a rock. You got caught between a rock and a hard place. Right? But, but, but there's another meaning. Chagve Hasela. Just, just wait, just wait. We learn a few lines. <laughs> Selah can refer to the klipas, they're called hard stuff that are blocking and holding the Shekhinah in captivity. But also Selah can mean the very, very mysterious high levels where the Shekhinah hides in a reclusive hidden place. Bebchenas Hester in a concealed state. As it says in Eitz Chaim from Biariza. The Malchus da'atzilus Bebriya Nikra Esther. 
that when Malchus of Atzilus, the Shekhinah, that's called the Malchut element of the world of emanation, which the world of emanation is still is a godly world. When she goes down into the lower world, that's called already Galut. See, when she's in Atzilus, she can reveal herself with all of her godly glory. But when she goes down to hide in the worlds, that's, so that's, that, that's part of creation, but that's a concept of Golos Hashchina. She's not expressing herself. God is hiding in creation. It's not as revealed. So when the Shechina in Atzilus descends into Bria, Nikra Esther. She's already called Esther. Shem is Tateres because she's hidden. Because when she's hidden in the world of Bria, her powerful light as, 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 as the divine kingdom, as God's kingdom is not shining. It's already hidden. It's already obscured. Bereisha Bria, in the beginning of the world of Bria, that's already, again, that's, in, that's way, way, way above of the 70 ministering angels. But even that, when the princess who, 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 who belongs in the palace has to stay a night in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the presidential suite in the world of Astoria, it's already, 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 already a concealment. Because she belongs in a palace, not, not in the fancy, the fancy hotel in the Ritz Carlton. The princess doesn't belong in the Ritz Carlton. She belongs in a palace. So Atzilus is the palace. So even if she's going down in the Roy Shabria, it's already a concealment and obscuring on, on, on godliness. But on a worse case, when she goes into exile, into the 70 ministering angels, the Noga, the 70 ministering angels, they're part of the Klippa. That's what Noga is. Noga is already Klippa. It's part of the shells, part of the... Uh, then she needs, what did we say earlier? She, part of her goes down to the Klippa to give life to sustain the Klippa. And to a certain degree, she's abused by them. And she is, her energies are, are, are usurped by the Klippas and used for the terrible things that the Klippas want to do. But her deeper, higher self, she locks herself and hides herself so that no one can touch her. Sha'oz, behechrech, and that's why she, he says, behechrech, it is a must. She should not give them energy. She should not influence them. She can, she, she can only give them the chitzonius. What's the chitzonius? Only her external, and only her hind, only the energy coming from her back. But her inner, her inner light, Nemar, it says, that my, my glory to someone else I don't give. It actually says, for example, I'll give an example for that. On a simple level, when, when Esther went to Achashverosh, she was with him. Did she, did, was her intimacy with him one of depth? Did she give her soul to him? She had no choice. So on the most external, superficial level, she connected to him. But on a deep inner level, there was no bond. She didn't connect. She kept that separate. To the point that there is a Gemara that says, according to some opinions, she never went. She sent a Shida. She would send a, 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 a demon that would look like her. And be an imitation of her, like like uh, like all these uh, important people have imitations, that people look alike. She sent a lookalike that would go, and it was a demon that she would use kabbalistically. She was able to access these these beings and send them to the thing, which means in concept it means the most external shell of her. She sent to Achishverosh, not herself. She kept that right. As it says, the Pasik says, Chvoidi, God says, My glory, la'acher, to the other side, to the sitra achra, loy etein, I will not give that. Elo, what happens then to the panemius of the Shekhinah? Elo, oilo, la'maila, maila. But, but, but again, that level, since Hashem doesn't want to give it, since Hashem, the Shekhinah, doesn't want to give that to the Klippa, she can't remain in her visible place. Because if she remains in the level like she was before the Golos, in that same place, then the Klippa will have access to her. So she has to move to a place where they can't touch her. Which means she has to move away, away farther from this world. 
That's why there's less God. That's why there's no prophecy anymore. She shuts her faucets. She shuts all the. She shuts down her 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 access. She closes all the all the doors, or she she turns down the 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 flow, because she doesn't want to. And an external flow she gives to the cleaver. She rises high, high, lehisaser to hide ba'almen steaming in the concealed world, dafka, where there is no klipas. See, in the higher hidden world, the klipas don't exist there. Shanikra, that's called bayoimahu. That's called that day. So what happens? Vanoichi Hashem says that's referring to the shechin over here. Astir, astir, I will hide panai my face, my revelation. But, but in revelation, the inside of my revelation, the external part of my, me, I'm, giving, I w- I'm going to exile. But the panai, the panemius of me, I'm going to hide it deeper to in, in a more removed place from the world. I'm going to deposit it in a safe box so no one can access it. The lo yediyah b'shem klal, in a world that is not known. So God, and therefore people ask, where is God? Because he, because the Shechina went up into a hidden place, and so much so that God goes to a place where He is beyond the name. The Shechina goes to a nameless place. Because what's names? Names is an identity, a way to identify, a way to access. A name is an access point. So every name of God is a certain revelation of who He is and what He is through His name. But when God recoils into Himself above his names, then he's not known by a name. So Hashem goes high. Now the various names of Hashem are connected to all the spherot. And since the spherot have higher spherot and lower spherot, so the names are higher names and lower names. What's the highest name of God? What's the highest revelation? The most sublime revelation of Hashem? Shem Havaya. In Shem Havaya itself, there's different pronunciations for Shem Havaya. The highest Shem Havaya is the one that's pronounced in a certain way that it indicates Chachma. Shem Havaya the Chachma. It's referring to Havaya of Chachma. Of the, of the, of the, of the, of the supernal sphere of wisdom. But where is God? God is not in that sphere. He, during the time of exile, He goes beyond that sphere of Chachma. That means the Eser spheres are empty and hollow. Because the divine flow is not flowing through them. That's why it says, in the, there's a Pasuk that says that during the exile, Nohar Yechrev Yechrav V'yavesh. The river dried up. Because I, it's not that there's no river. The river went underground. It, it, it hides into itself. And it's not revealing itself through the regular revelations. That's why there's no te- temple and there's lack of prophecy and lack of divine communication, and we sometimes feel so far. So, he goes up above the Shem Avai of Chachma, but it doesn't mean he goes beyond every name, he locks himself into one name. Which name? Hashem goes up into the name of Eke. As we know, when, Hashem, when Moshe Rabbeinu asked God, what's your name? And Hashem says, Eke Asher Eke. He says, when the Jewish people are going to say to me, God sent you to me, what's his name? And Moshe, and, Moshe, and God answers, Moshe, tell them my name is Eka Asher Eka. That's interesting. Why is he using that name? We never have that name. It's always Allah. The answer is, <laughs> it's very sad. The Jews are saying, what's his name means? We've been calling him and he hasn't answered. So what's it? which God are you talking about? We've been, we've been knocking on the door of Avaya, he didn't answer. We've been knocking on the door of Shaka, he didn't answer. We've been knocking on the door of Elohim, and he didn't answer. These are the names that our forefathers taught us. They connected to God through all these channels, and he hasn't been home. It's like when you go and you knock on someone's door, they don't answer. You track on a, so then you think, did I get the right address? So that's what they're asking Moshe, what's his name? So God answers, yeah, I'm going to teach you a new name that you don't know. When I go during the time of exile, I escaped into a name that's very, very hidden. What's that name called? Eka. Eka means I will be in the future, but not now. In other words, I'm preparing for a future revelation, but now it's still a mystery. I'm going, that's Keser. What's Keser? Keser is pre-revelation. 
Chachma is already revelation. Kesser is the pre-revelation, before it's revealed. God recoils all the way into the, into the, distant, into the distant heavens of heavens of, of Kesser. That's where the Shekhinah rises, all the way up into, into the Pneumius of Kesser. But there's no revelation on the outside. Bishem Eka de Kesser, now of Kesser, I was so excited just for this purpose because I'm going to give you now for Shira Shirim tomorrow. And that's the meaning, you better have this Kavana tomorrow. And that's the, re- that's the meaning when we say, Yonasi my dove, Bechagve, Hasela has gotten caught in the cracks of the rock. Sela is Gematria Keser. Not Keser. Is Gematria Eke. Aleph, hey. Yud K. So when it says my dove ran, got stuck in the cella, means that, that the Shekhinah hid herself all the way high up into Keser. Instead of her manifesting and flowing through all the sphero downward into the, to be visible in the creation, she hid herself in Keser. Where is Eke Keser? So Eke, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, where is Eke Gematria Sela? The numeric value of Sela is 160. Samach is 60. Lamed is 30. So 60 and 30 is 90. Plus Ayin is 70. 90 plus 70 is 160. So Sela is 160. Now let's take a look at the word Eke. Eke is only Gematria 21. How does 21 get to 160? However, if you use the hidden letters in Eke, the Oisi is Hamiloi. So the hidden letters are when you say Aleph, you have Lamed Pei, that's you don't see. So Aleph, if you also count the hidden letters in the Aleph, it's 111. Because Pei and Lam Pei is 80, Lamed is 30, is, is 110. And another plus an Aleph is 111. The Hey is Hey Yud. And there's two Hey's. So it's Hey Yud and Hey Yud. Hey Yud is 15. Hey is, right? 15 and 15 is 30. 111 plus 30. One forty-one, so that's Aleph Hey Hey. You're left with the Yud. What's Yud? Yud is ten, but the Yud has Yud Vav Dalid. Yud, the Vav Dalid is hidden in the Yud, so that's another ten. The Vav and the Dalid is six and four. So how much is Yud? Yud is twenty. So one hundred forty-one plus twenty, one sixty-one. How much is Selah? One hundred sixty. Remember the golden rule, gematrias are always good if they're off with one. And that's not by chance. There's a very deep secret to that. But that's the what it is. So, Sela and Eka is the same name. So when it says, Yoinasi my dove, Bechag Veya Sela, is caught in the, in the cleft of the rock, means that during the time of exile, the Shechina rose up and hid in the secluded space of Keser, in the pre-revealed state, and the reason for that is so that the Klippus will not be able to get a hold of her. So she remains safe. Internally. Externally, she makes herself vulnerable and she suffers the suffering and the pain and, of exile. And this is the meaning where it says in another Pasuk, it says, V'sim b'sela kanecha. You put your nest in a stone. What does that mean? That God puts the Shekhinah, which is his nest, in a very secluded place in a cellar, which means into Keser. He hides the Shekhinah in Keser. But what happens to us then? It's very dark down here. And that's the time of exile. astir astir panai. It's concealment, it's darkness. Vezeh astir panai, and this is the meaning I hide my face. My innermost is hidden. Where is it hidden? On that day. What's that day? That day is Keser. In the concealed worlds, in the concealed worlds, what are these concealed worlds? The levels of Keser, which are called the ancient of days. The Erech Anpin and the long face. These are the two levels of Keser, which are both higher than Chachma. It is enough to those who understand. That's what happened to the Rebbe also. See, if you open your, if you only tune in a little to Hasidus, you can see everything. 
Where's the Rebbe the last 32 years? What do you think? He told us Mashiach is here and said, go, 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 go fly a kite on your own. He took responsibility for this generation. Where is he? The Rebbe is Malchus. The Rebbe is the Shechina. Transcended into a place of Keser for this period of time until, until, uh, until we will see him, Be'ezer Hashem. There's an astir, astir panai. There's a, this, is, this is this concealment. Our th- last 32 years is Megillah Sesta. And we have Achashverish, and we have Haman, and we have Charvaina. We have all these players that are in the Megillah are here today as well. You can figure them out on your own. Figure out who Biden is, and who Trump is, and who, and who, and who. All these, all these guys. Who's who, and what's what, and who Trudeau is from Canada, and who Chvez uh, uh, Cameron from England. The, the whole, everybody's in the Megillah. We're not reading a story of what happened back then. Literally every single event that's going on right now, and all the players with, with that Choleta Guterres from the... Uh, from the UN, they're all in there. With Zeresh. Zeresh is there too. I'm not going to tell you who she is. I'm not saying. But in the future it says. <laughs> so this, seems, this is all very heavy on the heart. This is concealment. But in the future it says. Oh, get ready, put your seatbelts on. Ah! This is good, this is good, let's go. These are secrets, these are secrets. No one in the world teaches you these secrets. Ah! No one, no one. You can listen to all the classes in the world. No one teaches you what we learn over here. In the future it says, You will say on that day, Behold, Elokeinu, our God, Zeh. Here he is. So what does that mean? Uh, oh, what does that mean? That the godliness that was hiding in Keser, that very Shechina that went up into Keser, the Panai that went up into a concealed state, suddenly, Hin Elokeinu, Zeh, that Bayoi Mahu, that concealed world where the Shechina is hiding, that entire world came down over here. And it's in a way where we can say Zeh, we hoped for it all the time. We didn't throw our, we didn't throw the towel in. We didn't give up. We didn't give up on redemption. We didn't give up on our faith that Mashiach is coming. With all the darkness, with all the prolonged exile. We stick to it. Behold, this is my God. We hope for him. Pidish, what does that mean? In the future. There will be the revelation of the concealment of Yoimahu of that day. Like it says, that means that God will come down. But let's understand something. It doesn't mean he will drop back down to a state of revelation and he will be revealed. He will bring the entire concealed world as it is in its concealment and he will bring that to revelation. Not that he's going to... Because you realize, as the word... Keser is very high. Chachm is much lower. So when the Eberster radiates through the spheroids, even though he's radiating closer to us, it's a much more diminished light. When the Shechina goes up into Keser, she's in an infinite space. Because Keser is infinite. So, on the one hand, you say we're going to go back to Revelation. Oh, so she's going to go back to filtered, filtered Revelation. No, it's not filtered. She will bring down that very, very concealed level where she is in her entire infinity. The entire heavens will come down to earth. The whole concealed world will become revealed down here with everything that's in it. That's the meaning of here. The Kamosha Kasa, like it says, Yechayenu. He will bring us to, he will, he will enliven us from, the, from two days. He will enliven us from two days. On the third day, he will establish us. We will live before him. 
Then he's like this. The third day will come. We'll see in a minute what means the two days. Yechayenu, he will enliven us more than Yoimaya, more than the two days. Mi Yoimaya means more than the two days. What's going to be by Yoim Ashlishi on the third day? Yekimenu, he's going to establish us. V'nichya, we will live, live fun of, with the exposure of his face, he will be completely revealed to us. So what does that mean? Because in the days of Mashiach, in the days of the future, there will be the revelation of the infinite light. Shebe Keser, that's in the crown. The Oirein Sof that's in the crown will be revealed down here. Shanikri Yoimahu, that's called that day. It's also called the third day. What he's saying is that that day is called the third day. Because Yoimayim is the current time. We'll see soon why it's called Yomayim, two days. That's the current time. Yom HaShlishi is referring to the future. Beis HaMikdash HaShlishi, the third temple, the third day. And that's called Yom Ahu, that day, because it's not here yet, it's the future. Shalom, Shalom Aylam Bina, it's higher than Chachmeh Bina, Shenikra Yomayim. What are the two days? The two days are, day means revelation. The two primary revelations that are interactive with the world from the day the world was created until Mashiach. What's the main lights? What's God's interface with creation? What's the portal from where God interfaces and, 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 and interacts with the world? The portal is Chachma and Bina. Chachma and Bina, like we discussed earlier, is mitigated light. But that's called Yomayim, two days. But in the future, by Yom Ashlishi on the third days, we're gonna we're gonna way surpass Chachme and Bina. We're going directly into Keser, into the Orient Sof, into the infinite light, and that's gonna come down over here. V'nichya lefanav, we're gonna be enlivened by his pnimius of that level. stated elsewhere. and this is the meaning you will say on that day. That means when that day will come. This God, which God? The gods from Bayoimahu, from that day. That lofty, 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 lofty level of Yoimahu, of that day. We will then be able to say, Zeh, this is it. But here's the thing. That's going to be an experience of the future, but it's based on what? It's going to be an experience of the future, but it's based on what? On us enduring the effects and sticking it through now when, when God is in that space, but hidden from us. Now is when we bond with that level. We bond with the level not when it's revealed. We can only bond with it in the darkness. And in the end, after we've connected ourselves to that level of God in the darkness, then it reveals itself later. We don't have access to it when it's revealed. We only have access to it in the dark. During the time when Esther is hidden. In Helekeinu Zelenoichach, Shepchinas Hu, this Hu, this concealed, Hanelam Vesosum, that is obscured and hidden, Yavelidei Gilui, will come to a revelation, until we will say to it, Hine. Hine is when you can point with your finger to something. Hine zeba, behold he's coming. Hine lekeinu zeh, this is our God, lenoichach. And the reason for that is, lefi shemeyer oirein soif, the oirein soif, the infinite one, shahoyem mestater venelam bepchenas almen stimen, that was hiding and concealing in the con in concealing itself in the concealed worlds, Kaniskalia, like we said earlier. Bipidish, when we explain the meaning of the word Astir Panebayoimahu, I will hide my face in that day. So that level, love of the day Gilulamata, that will come down here into a revealed state. Bibchinas Almadi is Galian. In the reveal, we don't have to be afraid that it's going to be usurped by the clippers because the clippers will be already removed from the earth. They will be gone. And therefore, it can reveal itself down here without any, without any repercussions. Dafka. Okay. It's going to be revealed in the revealed worlds, down here. And, and that's why in such revelation, 
when Bayoima, who will be revealed, is this higher than Atzilus. This is Oren Soif. This is Keser like. When that's going to be revealed, we can understand why all prophets and prophecies, what's prophecy? Accessing Yetzira, Bria, higher prophets access the world of Atzilus. These are all spherot, attributes. The whole prophecy comes from Netzach and Hod, which, are, which mainly, that's according to Kabbalah, Netzach and Hod is the source of prophecy. We're going into Keser, way above it. And Keser will be revealed down here. So what will be the value of prophecy? Nothing. But now he asks, Now it seems like these two psukim contradict itself. Because here it says, I will hide that by Yoimahu, the, the Yoimahu is hidden. Because it says, I will hide my face by Yoimahu. The other verse says, that, that God is revealed. That Bayoimahu, the Bayoimahu, the godliness of Bayoimahu is revealed. So it contradicts. The answer is in Golos, God recoils his revelation into the Bayoimahu world and he doesn't reveal it in the, in the revealed world and it is hidden. But at the time of the Giyula, that will be revealed. So let's see. Implies the future. The Khan Omer, and here he says, he will hide his face in the future on that day. In concealed worlds. And here he says, that we will be able to say, here is our God in the revealed world. Because means we can point to it down here. Canal. So how does it work? Here he says he's going to conceal it in the concealed world. And here he says you're going to be able to see it in the revealed world. The answer is because the, the concealed worlds themselves will become revealed. But the idea is, as he explains, No. I think I'm reading it wrong. And I made the same mistake when I was preparing. And I thought I'm going to catch it now, but I didn't. So... Reverse. Let's start again. Let's l- let's read the question carefully. These two psukim contradict each other. Why? When it says, I will hide my face on that day. So what's that day? So earlier we were learning that day is referring to the time of exile. Time of the story of Esther. Story of Esther was a time of exile, time of concealment. Or we can say now, times of concealment, times of hardship for the Jewish people, times of darkness for the world. And the verse, Va'amar Bayoimahu in Elekeinuzeh is referring to Mashiach's days. Like I'm trying to say, like we were saying earlier. And that's what he implied earlier. But he says, no, but if you think about it deeper, it says, Va'amar Bayoim, no, I'm sorry. In the first, it says, I will hide my face by Yoimahu. So he's saying, by Yoimahu is referring to the days of Mashiach, because it's those days, future. In general, when the Torah says future, it means not a future time in exile, it means the end times. That's called Yoimahu. And it's saying that God will hide by Yoimahu. He will be hidden in the future, in the days of Mashiach. There's another verse that says, Va'amar by Yoimahu. That, 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 that on the days of the future, he will be revealed. So what is going to be in the days of Mashiach? Is Hashem going to be astir, astir? Is he going to be hidden or is he going to be revealed? So he's going to give you a new twist now, as we're going to see in a minute. Let's read the question. When it says, it implies future. And here he says in one verse, in Deuteronomy it says, that in the days of Mashiach he will hide his, even in the days of the future, he will hide his panemius, where he will still be hidden in a concealed world. And here he says, it will say in those days, behold, this is my God, that means he's revealed, he will bring his face down to be revealed in the revealed world. So where is God p- 
positioning himself? Is he hiding himself in a concealed world? Or is he coming down in the revealed world? And now he doesn't want to say the obvious, easy answer and say, who means in the future. So it can mean when the Torah was written, even exile was also the future. So in the time of Esther and in the time of, of the exile, it's hidden. But in the who that's happening afterwards, then it's going to be revealed. But since it's using the same term, Bayoimahu and Bayoimahu, it seems it's implying the same time. The time that's called Bayoimahu, which is the future, here it says it will be concealed, and here it says it will be revealed. So for that, Achinyanhu, the idea is, Sheyesh Oid Madregeshlishis, there's a third level. Milvad Almin Stimin the Almin Dizgalim. Besides the revealed world and the concealed world, which we said, during the time of the temple, God was in the revealed world. God descended into the revealed world. During the time of exile, God, God reveals His glory only in the concealed world, but not down here. So there are concealed worlds. These are the two dimensions of existence. Sometimes we call them the ocean and the dry land. Two realms of existence. A concealed world and a hidden world. An angelic world, to us it's concealed and our. Or even higher than the angels, concealed and the revealed world. There are different levels. Okay. But now he's saying there's a third level. What's the third level? This is the hidden of all hidden. That means there is revealed, there is hidden, and there is hidden from hidden. That means certain certain truths of God that are hidden even from the most hidden chambers. Who sasim vanella mamish, he is concealed and literally obscured. In the same way that to the revealed world, the same way like to us down here, we don't know what Gan Eden is, we don't know the angels, we don't know what an angel looks like, we don't know what it means, the, the experiences of the spiritual worlds, we don't know it. It's totally blocked from us. Because we're living in the revealed world. We don't know what's going on in the concealed world. So he says, the concealed of the concealed means that in those, those concealed worlds, even though they have access to their concealed world, they know what's happening. So to them, the concealed world is revealed. They have a concealed world that's concealed from them. Equally to how the concealed world is concealed from us. So there is revealed, there is concealed, and there is concealed from the concealed. And this is the meaning of He will enliven us from the two from the two miyamaya means from the two days. What's that referring to? Almin Stimin. Oh, so now he's learning like this. He will enliven us. Now he's lifting the he's lifting that verse up. Remember, we said earlier that Yoimayim, the two days, is Chachma and Bina. That's cool. And and Yoimashlishi, the third day, is referring to Keser. Now he's going even higher. Yoimayim means the concealed world, which is Keser. He's lifting it up. Keser is called Yomayim. Why is it called two days? Because in Keser there's two levels. There is the external part of Keser called Erech Anpin and the internal part of Keser called Atik Yom. That's Yomayim. Right? And then it says, Be'yoyim Gimel the third, on the third day, that's referring to the concealed of the concealed. What's beyond Keser? What's that? Upchenes radla. Radla means reisha deloy isyada, the head that is not known. Kiyedu ba kavan is the baruch shamar, as it is known in the mystical intentions that one should have when you say baruch shamar, which we say like this, that the various different stages that are mentioned, baruch shamar vahoya olam, baruch hu, baruch oime v'yaisa. Right? These are the verses we say. Blessed is the one who spoke the world. 
Blessed is he. Blessed is the one who says and does. So it says like this. Baruch Oime Viyose. doesn't say what Baruch Omer Yose is, so I don't know. But Baruch She'am Let's work the other way. Let's work, I was trying to work from the bottom up, but he's working the other way, according. Baruch She'am Avahaya Olam is referring to the steam in the cold steam and the concealed of all concealments, called the Reisha Deloya Siada, the head that's not known. Baruch Hu is referring to Chachma Steam, Hu, implies hidden. So it's chachma, but the hidden chachma. That means the chachma of keser. And finally, baruch oime v'yoyse is maybe the bina of keser. I'm not exactly sure. Well, in yant laceration, these are the three heads. So, I don't know what he's referring to. It would probably be a good idea to look up the kavanas of baruch she'omar, but he seems, he's only hinting to it over here and he's not giving us much explanation. So let's continue. So, okay, so we have now a new, he threw, he threw something else into the mix. What did he throw into the mix? What did he throw into the mix now? That there is the, there is the revealed world, there is the concealed world, and then there is the concealed of the concealed. Okay, now. Now in the days of Mashiach, what's going to be revealed? The concealed of the concealed or the concealed? We today only have access to the revealed world. Okay. Okay. Now there is a difference between the time of exile, we're starting Perik Yud, there's a difference between the time of exile, Asad Lave, to the time of the future. Because in the time of exile, Ksiv, Astir, Astir, Panai, I will hide my, my face, by Yomahu, on that day. So what does that mean? I will hide my face on that day. Shegam bibchenas Yomahu, hasasim venela. Shenikra almond steam him. Wow. Earlier we learned, he's, 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 he's giving us a much deeper explanation in Vanoichi Astir Astir Pana. Earlier we said like this because we, God doesn't want the Klippas to get a hold of, of his inner light, remember when we spoke about Esther? God does not want the Shekhinah, she's going to exile. He does not. So instead of keeping the Shekhinah revealed in the world, he, 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 he lifts the Shekhinah up and, and deposits her in a safer place. Chag ve'yasela, where? So what did we learn? He puts the Shekhinah into the concealed world. So she, if, she, if, she is, if she goes into the in concealed world, means she is revealed in the concealed world. She's not revealed in the revealed world, but she's revealed in the concealed world. That's what we learned earlier. So when you say Bayoimahu, then would mean I am hiding my face by doing what? By depositing her, by depositing my face, by putting my face, by placing my face in the concealed world. So I'm putting my face in the concealed world. Now he's learning deeper. No. He's hiding his face so deep that he's ha being hidden even from the concealed world. Vanoichi astir panai, I am hiding my face. Bayoimahu means not in the, in the hidden world. It means from the hidden world. Hashem is retracting so far up that he is hiding even from the concealed world, which means he's hiding even from Keser. From the two levels of, he's hiding from Atik Yomim and Erech Antim. Earlier we said he was hiding from Chachma and Bina, from the Sviris, from the manifest revelation. No, he's hiding even from Keser, because he's rising in steam in the cold steam, in the concealed of all concealment. Even from Bayoi Mahu. The Astir, Astir Panai, I will hide my face even from Bayoi Mahu, even from that day, even from the, 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 the concealed world. Even the Yomahu that is concealed and obscured, that is called the concealed world, he will be obscured and hidden. 
So where does he go to? Where does he lodge himself? In the, in the hidden of all hidden. Or, like that place is called, the head that's not known. Purim, we go there because Purim we have to do Adeloyada. We have to get dr- drunk on Purim, intoxicated till we reach Loyada. What's Loyada? Reisha de Loyasyada, the head that's not known. That's where we touch. And you think, you think this is Tam Narishkeit, Chas Vashalem, that I'm telling you this because he doesn't say it in the Maimur. Let me share with you something. Just some thoughts for Purim. WhatsApp coming today. Mechayev in Ishlip Suma Bipuria Adaloyoda. A person has to make himself happy on Purim and Taxi doesn't know. Ula Yesh Loimar, maybe this means Sha'anu Srichim Lahagiya Bipurim. We need to arrive in Purim. Lahadarge shall ain't sof to the level of ain't sof. Shebid radla in in the level of Raisha Dala Yada. In the level of 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 the Lo Yada. Raisha Dala Yas Yada. Haina Adalo Yada. This is Michi Ravnoi sending it out to the Shluchim to them. And everybody, of course, he, like, you know, you know, pays attention to what he, you know, like, like wow, what, is, what does that mean? Like, uh, it's cool. So mi- I met Michi in the morning. Michi sent it to me, too, in the morning today. If you know Michi Ravnoi. And I said, cool. He said, yeah, I was thinking about that. I came up with a little Torah. Like, yeah, now I have the source for him. Send it to him. Hold on a second. I gotta get the picture for him. All right. Um, good. That's that's in the time of exile. Hashem recoils all the way, all the way up. Now, what, what? Now, when Mashiach will come, what does that happen? We will say that you will say on that day. So, what's going to be when Mashiach will come? We will say This this is our God. That means. That the concealed world of Vayoimahu will become revealed. So, which what will be revealed? The concealed of the concealed, or the concealed? In the verse, it doesn't say the concealed of the concealed. It doesn't say that. It says Vaomar Vayoimahu that Vayoimahu will be revealed. But the hidden of of all hidden will not be revealed. In other words, that place where Hashem is going in the time of exile, where He hides Himself. So there's three levels. There is the manifest revealed world. There is the hidden world, which we never had access to. When Mashiach will come, we'll have access to the hidden world. The hidden world will drop down and will be revealed completely down. But where God went during the time of exile was that He he lifted Himself up. He he raises the Shekhinah up to a place of Reisha Deloy Yisyada, to a place that's not known. It's hidden even from the concealed worlds. So if it's not known to the concealed worlds, and the concealed worlds, and the concealed worlds spill their beans and reveal everything down here, since if they they haven't cracked that, then they they can't reveal that. That's still hidden. But Purim, the miracle of Purim is from that place. Because that's where God lifted himself up during the time of Purim. And that's where he interacted. When we woke God up from asleep, so to speak, on Purim, from which level were we, where were we, on which level were we, were we interacting? We were interacting on the place of steam and the cold steam and on the level of Esther. Astir Panai, with Esther we were, conceal- we were communicating. With the concealment of all concealments. And that's where the miracle of Purim happens. 
So therefore, even when Mashiach comes and we are swimming in godly light, but Purim is like, because on Purim we're touching the concealed of the concealed. So I know we got a little upset when I said, I saw in your face, you got a little like, you thought I was going to say that when Mashiach will come, we'll have not just the reveal, we'll have the reveal. No, but then we wouldn't have Purim. So it's not like we don't have it. We have it, but we have it on Purim. But for that, we have to take a little bit and get a little intoxicated. Because if you stay in the world of, of the, if you stay in the world of, of, of regular consciousness, then you stay in the revealed world. Then there's no revelation. You have to, you have to meet, you have to meet it where it where it's at. Where is it at? <laughs> in the place of concealment of all concealment. So you got to go up there a little bit, and that takes a couple of chayims. Um, the level called Yoimahu, Yovalade Giloy will come to a revealed state. Shemepchinas hu nasa ze. The Bayoimahu becomes ze. And that's not something to sneeze at. That means that Keser will be revealed. Not Radlo, not Resha de Loyas Yada, but Keser will be revealed. Pretty neat. Avil ain't kol ze. Rak bepchinas almond steamin. This is only in the concealed worlds. Shayavale de Giloy, they're going to come to a revelation. Veloy lamay lamahem, but not higher than them. Shasasum gam mehem, because that's hidden even from them. I can reveal to you whatever I know. I can't reveal to you what I don't know. So if the concealed worlds, if the concealed worlds, if there are secrets that are hidden even from the concealed worlds, and what's that? The place where God goes to during exile into a very secluded area that's hidden even from the concealed worlds. So, they, so even the time of revelation of Mashiach, where heaven descends to earth, this is hidden even from heaven. Mashenkim is mana golos, which is in the, in the time of exile. Shemaster Ponavi hides his face gam bayoimahu, even from bayoimahu. Koloimar shenista venelam, he is hidden and concealed. Gam bihioi semelubish ba almond steam in shenikra bayoimahu. He is hidden even when he, even from being enclosed in the world of bayoimahu. Vazel shamed azal, and that's why the sages say, Very strange statement in Talmud Mesechtes Tractic Chagiga Davhe. In, in Tractic Chagiga, the Gemara says all the way in the bottom of the page, Ahmed Aleph. It says, the verse says, "Vehistarti panai mehem." I will hide my face from them. God says, "I will, I will, I will be upset at them. I will hide my face from them." And the emphasis may hem from them. So the sages say, any Jew who every time he calls out to God, God immediately answers him, is not Jewish. You got to check him out. Because anybody who's not part of this concealment is not of them. Because God says, of them I will hide my face. Basically, what the Gemara is saying, if you don't have tsaris, you're not Jewish. If everything is working perfectly, uh, literally, that's what the Gemara says. If you're not behester upon him, if you're not experiencing this darkness and this concealment, you're not part of the Jewish people. Because from the Jewish people, then. So then one of the sages, they accuse one of the sages that he's like, he, he, he's, he's, not, he's rich and he doesn't have problems. No one ever tries to take his money. And that's a part of it is that, 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 that he's always, that, that, that um, the Jews' possessions were always vulnerable to being stolen. That's what the Gemara is talking about. And that's part of the concealment. So they accused one of the sages that he was like doing, and he says, no, if you would only know how much money I have to pay the mafia guys that they leave me alone, then, then you would know them. And they said, no, 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 they stole them. They, they, the Gemara has a whole discussion over there. <laughs> In other words, they were beginning to say, are you really Jewish? Everything is, uh, you're not suffering yet. Yeah. But what does that mean? It almost seems like, it, it, like this is like a negative. It's not a plus. It's a minus. The answer is, <sighs> there's something so deep about this concealment. Because the concealment doesn't mean withdrawal and disconnect. The concealment means I'm concealing myself from, from my outer self because I don't want to have a superficial relationship with you. I want you to seek me out and connect to me in my most private inner space. So I will, 
retract from the more external, visible place, so you have no choice but to, but, but, but to connect to me on a level of essence. The point of here is not the concealment. The point is, God says, from you, the Jewish people, it, it actually says, it's an amazing thing, when King Solomon b- built the temple, um, King Solomon built the temple, he prayed that the temple should be a place where God will respond to the prayers of everybody. So he has this most amazing prayer, the Talmud says. He prayed that whenever a non-Jew comes to the temple and prays, God should immediately answer him. If Jew comes, eh, yeah, no, not necessary. He particularly asked God that if a Gentile comes, his prayer should always be answered. And the Talmud says, because a Jew, if God won't answer him, he'll still be Jewish. He'll still be Jewish. <laughs> the Gentile, if he comes one time and he doesn't get answered, he's going he's gonna to leave. He's not going to stick or stick around. But this is the whole idea. If every time you ask me for something, you get it right away, that means you're, you're not even love me. What do you love? You love about me. I love that I can give you your money and your needs and so forth. I don't want that. God says, I need it. I want you to want me. By a Rebbe, it's the same thing. Everybody knows by the Rebbe that by the people that were the closest to him would not get what they, you know, they can bless things. They didn't always, it was like, you know, some whatever comes to the Rebbe, he doesn't have children, immediately gets the blessing. And the chassid, who's like the Rebbe's chayzer, who's giving over the Rebbe's chassid, Rabbi Elkan. He was the Rebbe's chayzer for 30, 50 years. He's, he's repeating, he doesn't have children. And the Rebbe couldn't get him a miracle. Just the way it is, the closer the people are, they would be, they would be treated, not, it's, it's much tougher. The farther, uh, get all kinds of goodies. It's very easy to get. That's the way it is. Whoever is not in the concealment is not of them. But now we understand because the concealment is so deep. Doesn't like it. Shem ebchenas aster ponim From this concealment, ze shem muster gamba yoimahu. Oh. But here's the point. From this concealment weird that he's hidden even, when that is revealed, that's the Nakuda. The Nakuda is one day that will, where he was in that place will be revealed and then we'll appreciate that he, that, he, that, that he allowed us to connect to him on that level. It's like one day we're going to experience the godliness of the Holocaust. One day we're going to experience the godliness of the Holocaust. Now it's hidden. But when did we connect to it? During the Holocaust, we connected to it. During those four darkest, five darkest years of Jewish history, that's when we connected. The Jewish soul connected to that, to a level that is impossible to ever comprehend. Then that, and that's the story of Purim. Purim is Megillas Esther. Megillah means to read the concealment or to unravel, to, to uncover the rift, to be, bring Giloy the concealment itself. So only on Purim, however, that flashes. We have that revelation. From Reisha the Loyas Yada, from the place, which is going to be, it's going to raise eyebrows even in, the, even, even in the days of Mashiach. Because the ordinary revelation of the days of Mashiach will be the upper world will be revealed down here. When it comes to revelation, when it does come to revelation, it is so much greater than the regular revelation of the future. That that that. The, the regular Hine Lekenuze is considered very, very amateur in comparison to the revelation of, of Purim. And that's the reason why Megillas Esther, Shaloy Tebatel, will not become Batel, Gamla Asid, even in the future. That the level of Megillas Esther, which is Astir Panai, I'm hiding my face is hidden even from Bayaimahu. Sheyuvin gam kefip shutai. This now will be understood also on the simple level. The Bayaimahu hazer la'asit. That in the Bayaimahu of the future, she'az gam kenya muster, then it will also remain hidden. 
Even though Yoimahu will then be revealed. For it to be Because the Megillas Esther is even higher. It is even higher than the concealed worlds. Because even there, it is concealed and obscured. The That's how high Megillas Esther is. And this is all connecting to what we were saying earlier. Now, how does this all connect to what we were saying in the, begin- in the last two classes? Because we, this is what we were talking about. That then, then was revealed the crown of the king, the garment of the king. These are things that are just never revealed. These are like of the deepest of the deep. And they, and they came down during Megillah says. Now, till now we understood that Esther is not the Megillah says. But remember we said earlier that two things, two parts of Torah are not going to be, are, are not going to be nullified. One is Megillah Sester, and the other one is the laws of the Torah. And the halachis will also not become nullified in the future. This is also based on, similar to what we said earlier. Because even in the, fu- even in the future, when the, when the heaven will be exposed, the Yoimahu, when the Yoimahu level will become tangible and revealed, but the laws, they will be a mystery, they will be enticing, they will be something we're curious about, even in the future. It's not like when Mashiach comes and we will know everything, we will then understand every halacha. We will still be curious about the halachas because they, will for, they're, because they come from the concealed of all concealment. These laws of Torah are so obscure, they're so deep, they're so mysterious, that even in the future world, when we're going to get the secrets of the Torah, they will still be, they will still be curious about them. It's not like, okay, everything is revealed. Because they're even higher than the concealed world. And they come from the concealed of all concealed. The Dalai Lama is enough to those who understand. And this is the meaning that all the prophets are going to be cancelled. Like the sun rays are nullified in the sun. Even though the root of all prophecy. Where does prophecy come from? Prophecy means someone is able to enter the concealed range and expose some secrets from there. That's the point. Where is prophecy coming from? A leak. What's prophecy? It's a leak from the concealed world. It's like leaking to the media, like they leak private information. So when the concealed world leaks, someone gets information and hack, uh, not, not a hack, uh, the prophecy is intentional. They, they, they inform, secrets are informed from the concealed world. Now, what's going to happen when the entire concealed world will become revealed? So the fact that you have someone who knows some secrets from the concealed world won't be a big deal because the entire concealed world itself will be revealed. So it will be canceled. But Megillah Esther, which is read on Purim, that's real secret. Because that's coming from what's concealed even from the concealed world. The book of Esther. They're coming from the concealed world. When the prophet has a, a prophetic vision, it's revealed to him. Like it says, like it says, God with a vision to him, to him I reveal myself. It's only a ray from the concealed world. And a radiance of the essence of the emanator. Which is 
nothing in compared to the essence of the emanator. Ava Megillas Esther, but Megillas Esther. Vahalachos and the laws of Torah. Sharshan Lamailam Abchenaziva Oyer. They are higher than the ray than the than the ray and the light. Elo Bebchenasamar Atzmoy. For rather they are of the emanator itself. Shubchenas Atzmo Samatzel. A little problematic, to, which I'm not, I'm not getting here. Here he's saying that the halachos and, and Megillas Esther are not a ray, but they are of the substance of the of the of the luminary itself. They are of the substance of God. As we said earlier, remember I said earlier, I said Megillas Esther is God Himself. There is the higher worlds, but then there is God Himself. Fine. Problem is that earlier when he's saying why. Why it's going to be canceled in the revelations of the future? He doesn't say because the entire light will be revealed. It would have made sense to say, "Why do I need a ray?" There's three levels. There is our world, which is a world of darkness. There is prophecies, which are rays from the light, projections of the light. Then there is the light, the concealed world itself, which is the light. And then there is what's concealed from the concealed, which is the essence from where the light comes from. So there's the essence, there is the infinite light, and there is a ray from that light. But what's a little what, 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 what's bothering me is that in earlier when he said why Navua will be canceled, he just said, let's go back to the world. It's only a ray. Which is nullified to the essence. Why does he use the essence? Shenikramo'er, which is called the source of the light. Why doesn't he say it's called the light? The next level is Mo'er. Megillas Esther is Mo'er. So I don't, I, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit um, bothered by that because I just don't understand. Avo Megillas Esther va'aloch eshar shon l'mayim v'chinas ziva oyer v'chinas amor atzmoi shu v'chinas atzmo samatzo shenim shal l'guf hashemesh, which is compared to the substance of the sun. Shenikrastuma de kolstimin, which is called the concealed of all concealments. Oiradla or Reisha the Loyas Galian, as we said earlier, or the head that's not revealed. Reisha the Loyas Yada, the head that's not known. Sheein Loy Bittel the Hefsik that has no end. Kihu Nitzchi, and that's why it can never be canceled. It is eternal. Bebchenes Nitzchi is with the eternity, the Atzmos Oirin Soif of the essence of the Oirin Soif. The Adarab, and on the contrary, Kol Nohoiden Mischashchin Kame. When you bring out a Megillus Esther, everything becomes darkened. In other words, the brightest lights are considered dark, are considered nothing compared to the Megillus Esther. Because it says when you reveal God Himself, even the lights of Kesser are considered darkness. They're nothing in front of this light. Like it says in, in Zohar, Dafilo Ertzach, even the most brilliant light, which is as it's translated in Kabbalah, the concealed level of Chachma of Erech Anpin, which is the lights of Keser, the wisdom of Keser. And then it says, a, a, a even more brilliant light, which is the Moach Stima of Atik Yomen, which is even higher than Erech Anpin. The Chachma of, of Atik Yomen. Uchamu is considered dark, before the, the cause of all causes, the level called Radla. And higher than that. Even the thought and the wisdom of Ak, of Adam Kadmon, even that power of Machshava cannot grasp him himself. Adam Kadmon means primordial man, but this level is called primordial of all primordial. And this is the concealed of all concealments, which includes everything, the Dayla Maven. This only flashes to us on Purim. Only on Purim. And now, it's wild stuff. Let's learn one more piece here, Yudalev. And that's why the sages also say 
Mordechai Menatoh Raminai. So we spoke about Esther, but now he's going to throw Mordechai into the mix as well. If Mordechai is part of the Megillah story, so Mordechai has also got to come from that level because he's part of the, of, the, of, the, of the story of Purim. He's a major actor, even though the main story is called after Esther. So who is Mordechai? So the sages ask, where is Mordechai in the Torah? They ask where Esther is in the Torah, and that's because he will conceal his face even from the concealed world. That's where she is rooted. That's where Queen Esther, now you understand something, Queen Esther is rooted in that level. And where is Mordechai rooted? So the sages say, what, what's his name all about? They say, well, we find him. In the spices of the Ketoris, that's where we find Mordechai. The Ketoris is the, the incense that they that they that they would smoke every day in the temple and would give it a, a, a delicious fragrance. And there were 11 different spices. It's interesting, this is chapter 11, and now he talks about the Ketoris, which is 11 spices. So one of the, one of the um, ingredients for the Ketoris was a spice called more. And particularly, it's called wild moor. Moor dror, wild moor. It's like we say wild mushroom. Which means there's two types of moor. There's moor that you farm. And there's moor that just grows in the wild. And that's one opinion that moor is a type of a plant. This is a, the, the moor that grows maybe on mountains. It's some wild moor. Another opinion is that it comes from a wild animal from a glands inside the neck of a certain type of a mountain mountain uh, deer or something like that. And you can take this musk from its, and from there you make a perfume. Whatever, umetargamino now. But that's what it says in the, in the Pasuk, it says you should take mor deror, wild mor. The translation, but where do you have Mordechai? Well, there is targum. Targum is the Aramaic translation, which was made by a convert, con convert, uh, uh, Unculus, who was a convert, a Roman who became Jewish, and he m he wrote a Aramaic translation of the Chumash. And in his translation, which obviously is a godly translation because it's accepted to have the deepest secrets in it, he translates the word Mordoror as Mira Dachya. which means pure more. Instead of being wild, he translates it as dachya. Dachya means tahar, pure. Clean more. So the Gemara, here, watch this, the Talmud makes a play on the words. The Talmud takes these two words, mira dachya, and puts it together and says Mordechai. Don't you hear Mordechai? Mira is the more. Dachya is dachai. So Mordechai is a, is, a, is a unification of these two words of Mordoror. That's pretty far-fetched. You're trying to find him in the Torah. You don't even find him in the Chumash itself. You find him in a translation of the Targum of the Chumash. But it's okay for the Talmud. It's not okay for us too. But what's the connection? What does that mean? Mori Dachya. Pirish Mori Dachya. So what does Mori Dachya mean? So Mari, the word Mari, more, also reminds you of a certain food that we eat coming up in a month from now. Maror, which is bitter herbs. Mar means bitter. So if Mar means bitter and Dachya means pure, it means pure bitterness. We're building something. We're, we're, we're constructing over here a whole construct. Mordechai is associated with pure bitterness. Well, what does it mean? Pirish Mordechai, Obchenes Meridus, which means bitterness. Shema Mokoim Torah, that's coming from a pure place. Da'ainu, ah. Obchenes Ahalachos. Mordechai, he is, he, he personifies the laws of the Torah. We know that Mordechai was the head of the Sanhedrin. He was a lawgiver. He was part of the great Sanhedrin, part of the Torah. 
He was one of the Anshe Knesset Sagdola, one of the men of the great assembly. So the laws of the Torah are very deeply connected to him. Now what do the laws have to do with bitterness coming from a pure, pure place? Shenemar Behem, regarding the laws of the Torah, it says, Halichos Eli Bakodesh. Uh, what's the full verse? It's a verse in Tehillim, chapter 68. Rahu Halichai Secha, they saw your, your goings, Elohim, your God, Elohim, they saw your goings. Halichais Eli Malki Bakodesh. Halichos Keli means the walking, the travels of Keli, my God, Malki, my King. So, what are the halachos? The halachos really means the routes that God takes, the route. Or as another verse says, Halichais Eilam Lai, eternal. Eternal roads, or or halichas olam, sometimes translated, walkways to the world. Olam lo is to him. So what does that mean? Pathways. The halachos are the roads where the king travels, where God Himself travels. So now he explains why that is. The laws are what. They're the word of God. Every law is an edict of how God says, I like, I want this world to look like. Kosher, not kosher. Pure, not pure. Legal, not legal. Qualified, disqualified. They're the word of God. The root of these halachos, where they're coming from, it is rooted, it is bound up in the essence of the emanator, mamish. Al-Kain, and therefore they're rooted in the, in the very, very source of source. Al-Kain behem dafka b'chinas hilachatz musa. And there are the path, passageways in where the essence of God travels, mamish. Elechein nikra halachos, that's why they call the laws. Al-derech meshel ha-melech. It's like, by way of analogy, a king, Kishahoylech, when he travels somewhere, when he gets into his coach, and he travels across the countryside, It's different when the king sends out a letter, when the king sends out a proclamation, when the king sends out a royal decree, or whatever it is, then he's not going. He sends his messengers. He sends his, he influences. From he remains here and his influence, which means his, whatever, whatever it is that he's projecting into his kingdom. But then there are times when the king himself gets into a coach, into the royal coach, and he travels. So that means that he himself, the entire king is being transported. That's the beauty of halacha. Halacha is God's entire self is traveling through every halacha. That's what it means. The, the walkways of keli, the roadways, the travel, the travel plans or the travel routes of keli of my God. Now even though these routes these, these laws are enclosed as we read them. They're all manifested in material things. And the subject matter of the laws are very physical. The subject matters of the, of the laws are the coarse entities of this world. Because the Torah is dealing with the, 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 the physical phenomenon in this world. Which the physical or the phenomenon of this world is the coarsest things, the places where God is the most concealed. As we discussed earlier in the Mimer, the physical is the most concealing on God. 
And that's why the physical world is called bitter, because it's full of klipa. It's full of unholiness. And that's why the physical world is called bitter. So that's why the laws that talk about the bitter world are called more deroyer or more redachia, pure, the pure more. They're pure because it's not, see the law that talks about the thief that's stealing, breaking it, you know, when a thief steals, when a guy is accused for theft or a person actually commits a, fe- a theft, what is the law? And the Torah goes into all kinds of different thievery and the, so, so it's dealing with some really, really dark stuff. But the law itself is, is the word of God dealing with these things. So it's the word of God coming from the highest of the high, dealing with the most bitter elements of existence, which is the lower world. That's why it's called pure, pure, pure bitterness. Because it's the bitter, it's, it's, it's of the subject of the bitter world. This is at the, at the lowest end of the klippas, which are called the harsh gevurais, where of Noga, of the world of Noga, of the world of the Klipa. Shenem are behem eshkelois meroirois, which it calls, it says about them that they are bitter, bitter um, clusters of grape. In Azinu, in Deuteronomy, it describes the grapes of wrath. So these, this world, the Klipas are called the grapes of wrath, bitterness. V'cholat Torah, and what does the Torah do? The Torah deals with all these bitter phenomena of this world, and what is it trying? And what is what's its intention? To sort out the good potential that's in it, to take out the right from the wrong, from the darkest elements of creation, and to separate the dark stuff, and eventually through the Torah dealing and cleansing and purifying, and 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 extracting and separating right from wrong, the klipas will eventually be um, completely detached and removed from the earth and this world will become the highest most expressive world of godliness no clip in it so what is the clip what is the torah doing the torah dives into the bitter the torah doesn't shy away the torah is very ambitious it it descends into the real real bitter bitter elements of existence to sweeten the dark, to sweeten the bitterness. So initially it's bitter, but the Torah comes down to convert the bitterness to sweetness. She letaher, to purify, ulatame, and to, to deem what is impure, impure, to separate it. Like all the laws pertaining to ritual purity or impurity. And that's why it says regarding the Torah, to separate, beinat tome or beinat between what is ritually impure and what is ritually pure. Now part of the, of the discussion of what's pure and impure, the Torah discusses which animals and which dead carcasses are impure and not good. Now there are certain seven impure rodents. The Torah speaks about literally, it goes into detail and sub-detail of various different rodents. And how the rodent died, and if it's in the laying like this, and if you touched it or what, and how much, how much of the rodent has to be to to, to transmit impurity? If you got a piece of the dead carcass, I mean, it's disgusting. It's, you're talking about a, a rodent, an impure rodent, and the Torah is the Torah is like combing through it. The holy, godly Torah is coming. But you realize what's what what, what it's discussing about these rodents. You realize what this means. Every rodent down here has spiritual forces that manifest in, ideolo- in, in ideologies in this world, in philosophies, in entire movements in this world are rodent movements. Forces that, you know, that, that happen and the Torah sorts. And when the Torah deals with the laws of rodents, it's actually purifying mankind and the entire society. And it's separating good from evil. It's doing, so it ha- it's bitter. It's a bitter subject, but eventually it's going to make a sweet world out of it. <laughs> which is all the process of purification of, of the bitter, of the separation. <laughs> of the bitterness of Noga. <laughs> That's why it's called bitter, pure bitterness. 
Chenes Meridus, it's bitterness, Shaba, that is coming, Memokam Tahar. It's coming from a very, from a very pure place. Shuakoyach Ma Shebechachma. What's the pure place where it's coming from? Torah comes from Chachma. Torah comes from the wi- divine wisdom. In divine wisdom itself is Koach Ma. The higher part of Chachma is the Ma. In Chachma itself, there's the Koach of Chachma, the Ma. The Ma is what is completely nullified in the Ein Sof. Ma is the first recipient of Or Ein Sof. And Torah is of the substance of Ma. That's as pure as pure can be. Because what's purity? The real meaning of purity is bitl. No, no substance, no self, no nullified completely. Like, a, like, a, like you say, etzem hashemayim letoar, a pure sky. That means there's no cloud in the sky. There's no, su- there's no metzias. There's no beingness. So chachma is the highest level. Of, and that pure chachma comes down to deal with the coarsest and, and, and most grossest elements in creation. To clean it up. All the harsh bitterness, ra, of the evil elements of Noga of Noga. Because Chachma is called pure. No, and when is it called Dachya? Interesting. It's not so much that the, first of all, the Chachma itself is called pure, because Koachma. But it's the main reason why it's called pure is because after the Torah descends, plunges down into the darkest elements and, and, and finagles its way through the darkness and doing an intricate, an intricate surgical procedure. That's what the Torah does, a surgical procedure, separating the cancerous materials from, from the good, from the good, doing a... And then it comes out and the sparks that were once stuck in darkness and in impurity are now rising from the darkness into purity. And that's called pure. The real idea of pure, you can only say when something was in a space of filth. You say, oh, it's such a clean car. That's after the car was in the dirt. After, you know, and it got dirty and now it's, oh, it's so clean. The clean is relative to the, to the dirt. So first it was, when is someone called Tahar? When they first were impure, then they went to the mikvah and they became tahar. Who will give tahar from tame? So first there has to be a tame, an impure state. From there comes the good. Is it not echad? What's echad? Echad is chachma. Bchinas chachma yalah de echad. The higher Chachma, because Chachma is in a state of absolute unity with God. It's pure oneness. And that is from where? That descends below. To purify. To, sh- to reject that which ought to be rejected. To call out what is impure, that is trying to, to, to uh, masquerade as pure. So the Torah comes and says, "Don't you're not going to fool me. Don't pretend you're kosher. You're not kosher. It's impure. The tame tame yikra, and that which is impure needs to be labeled and clearly called out for what it is. It's impure. But then, never to throw away the the the, the bath water, the baby with the bath water, but to purify that which is pure, to find all the good potentials. Say that you might say no, no, that is kosher, that's usable. That's what the Torah does. It does surgical procedures. Okay, Nakri, that's why the, to- the laws of the Torah are called Mordechai, More Tachya, the pure more, the dilemmate. The Zao, and with this he explains another verse. And that's why, so it's amazing. That's why Mordechai and Esther are going to be the sole survivors that are not going to be canceled. <laughs> because everything else is a lower level because these laws that are able to do such surgical are also coming from the concealed of all concealments. The power of, of, this, of this surgical to be able to take and the power of these laws are from a place that is not going to be canceled even when the mystical worlds are going to be revealed they're still going to be above it. 
But now with this, he also explains, however, a reverse in the, in the Megillah, which says, which is in the story of Purim, which speaks about how during the beauty con- contest, when the king was looking for a queen, and all the girls were being drafted to the palace, and they were coming to see the king, it says that no girl would enter, that would, would go and, 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 and spend time with the king unless she first spent an entire year in beautification. So she, she would soak herself up with different perfumes. So it says six months she was treated with treatments of Shem and Hamur, of more, of more oil. And six months she was with Bipsamim, with various different perfumes, spices. And then after such you know, being in the, in the beauty parlor for six months, for, for a year, then she would see the king. And they had different girls every day. Shisha chadashim v'shem and amor. Fine. So what's the deeper meaning? Everything, the, if the king is God, of course this is not just the Megillah, we wouldn't be spending the, such a holy day of Purim reading about Ahasuerus's um, fanatical women's lust like th- th- we're not th- this is not the story of, of of the Megillah you know the famous story the Alter Rebbe used to read the Megillah because the Alter Rebbe was the Bokhari and one year the Alter Rebbe was out of town and a, it was a different Bokhari someone else came and read the Megillah Someone else read the Megillah. And <laughs> after it was over, the Mittler Rebbe went over to that person. He says, Ashena Maisa, nice story. <laughs> Basically, the Mittler Rebbe never heard the story. When his, when his father read, he, he, <laughs> he saw the story up there. He saw all the... When this person read, he didn't, he didn't have those intentions. So the Mittler Rebbe says, ah, nice story of a palace with a king. <laughs> This is the idea. You have to hear the. You have to hear the story. God forbid, we should pollute our minds with the story of, of the Megillah. Like as, as a, as a. I mean, you know, that's the story. So we get the inside story. What's the inside story? If if the king is God, and the girls are who the souls, that are coming to be close to Hashem, to be intimate with God. So a soul, when it, when it wants to go into heaven, to the highest places of Gan Eden, in paradise, in the higher place, the soul has to, first mar- has to first be treated six months. Six months. Six months it's referring to Shem and Hamur. What's that? It has, to lo- it has to learn the laws of the Torah, which are called Shem and Hamur. It has to marinate in Torah law for six months. And six months in the spices, it has to learn six months Hasidus, and six months it has to learn Mishnah and Talmud and, and, and Rambam. And when the soul had soaked itself six months and six months, then she's ready to come in to be, to be, to be with the king. That's the inside story. That's what he says. Six months in Shemin Amor. It's referring to the godly soul. When the godly soul comes to Gan Eden, like it says, Chazal say, they announce, they make announcements in Gan Eden. In Gan Eden, they make announcement. Fortunate are those who come over here and their Talmud is in their hands. Their Torah studies in their hands. In other words, you got to come to Gan Eden, you got to come already with something. It's like the girls needing to come already treated. The soul cannot enter into Gan Eden. Only by having first six months with the more, with the more oil. Which is the occupation and the laws that are enclosed in the material. With bitterness. Because again, the gasus which talks, you study the laws of the coarseness and the 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 density of the of the lowliness of this world in which you engaged in the combing out 
the divine potential from all the from the from the impure klipa. La havdol bein atomei to separate between what's pure and what's not pure. Ulafisha bechachmi la davke bab chinas bitter is there. And since this beer, this purification comes from Chachmeh, Chachmeh is called oil. Like we find that oil is associated with wisdom. That's why when they were looking for a wise, when King David was looking for a wise woman, he brought a woman who came from, an, from the area full of olive groves where they made oil. Because the fact that physically they would make oil over there was a sign that there was a lot of wisdom there. So that's why it's called Shemen, but it's also more. Why? Because the Torah itself is called Shemen. But once you take the Torah and you actually study and purify the world with it, so you're putting the Shemen into the more. It was the Torah itself, before it engages the world, is oil, is Chachma. But the Torah is enhanced, but just like when you take oil and you soak it with spices, what happens? It becomes perfumed oil. And then the oil is so much more richer than what it was initially. Than, pure, than just plain oil. So too the Torah, after you utilize it to deal and purify the world, the sparks of holiness that are in the world elevate the Torah and make it perfumed oil. Make it more oil. Okay, Nikra Shemen Amor, Shemen. Oil itself is rooted in the Chachmei the source of Chachmei. And just like oil that's mixed with more, that the Shemen, the oil, absorbs the more. And it has a, a much, it has a great fragrance. It becomes fragrant oil. After the purification that happens through Chachma, through the supernal wisdom, into the more of Noga, of the Klippa, of the unholy world, Sha'ila rises back up with a good fragrance. And that's why, let's see, understand something. That's why the Torah has to be studied in this world. Because this purification process, the application of Torah to the klipa, to the unholy, and to sort it out, only happens down here. Up there, they study Torah, but in a spiritual form. So it's not dealing with the klippas. That's why it has to be down here. That's why they say to the souls that come to Gan Eden, did you come with Torah study? Did you learn halacha down here? Did you, did you sort it out? Do you have more oil? He says, no, no, I have oil. But no, no, if it's not more oil, it doesn't work. That's why they say the, the six months has to be, the woman had to be treated with Shemen HaMoyer. Shemen, That's why six months you should occupy yourself on a Shema B'Shemen HaMoyer with the, with the more oil. And six months in B'Samim, what's B'Samim? What's spices? If you only learned Halacha but you didn't soak up a little Hasidus, that's also a problem. And this Shemen Hamor, this is the this is the Mordechai. Shen Halachai, these are the laws. The Alkain, and now he concludes. That's why they will not be cancelled in the future. Because they will, because, because the Zer Sha'ama Megillas Esther. That's why it says Megillas Esther will not be cancelled. Shekoidl Bezegam Mordechai. When it says Esther won't be cancelled, it includes Esther won't be cancelled and Mordechai won't either be cancelled. The laws of the Torah. Shanemar, as it says, the Yemeya Purim lo Yavru. The days of Purim will never be, will never be removed from the Jewish people. The Dilemaven, referring both to Esther and Mordechai. But at first, it's not to be understood. Should I, what usage would the, it seems like that these laws will always be there? But the whole point of these laws is to comb and cleanse the world. Once the world is cleansed already, why do you need these laws already? After we will already conclude all the, all the rectifications and all the purifications, the Reish Peiches of the 288 sparks, 
which is the root number of all the sparks of holiness. Why are we going to need Shem and Amor? Which are these Birudim of the supernal Chachma. So wherefore, why does it say also regarding the laws of Mordechai, will not become cancelled in the future. The will be, they will be intriguing, they will be hidden. Even in the revelation of Bayoimahu, when the higher world will be revealed, they're coming from a place even higher than the than the than the than the, than the, than the hidden world, than the concealed world. It's going to become to a revelation. They will be special. Why would they be even necessary? It would seem if anything should be canceled, those laws will be canceled. Why do we have to study them? If 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 we're already after the purification, like it implies in Zohar that we won't study any more law, because we will only learn primia satire. But here it says that Mordechai will not be canceled. So to understand this. He says, I have to first preface three metaphors. But for that, we're going to have to wait for next week. So even though next week is after Purim, I think everybody's still going to be in the Purim spirit. We're still going to continue. And we're going to continue in this mimer at least another one or two more classes. Because I'd like to get to, at least as I set my goals, the first 23 chapters. Now remember, there's 96 chapters here. So if we're really enticed, we'll keep on going with this. Tulag Bomer, why not? <laughs> it's definitely keeping me on my toes. Ever, let's see Esther and Mordechai and the revelation of Mashiach now.